Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Learning Salon. We are here, uh, very excited to uh, listen to Jessica Flagg talk about her work. Uh, Jessica is a professor of collective computation, so I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of very interesting interdisciplinary discussions today. Um, before we start, a reminder that the Learning Salon is a bi-weekly now forum for uh, discussing bridges and contentions between biological and artificial learning. Uh, we usually talk about um, uh, sort of uh, neuroscience, cognitive science, AI, philosophy, and different uh, aspects of a particular question. So if you're from any of those uh, particular disciplines, please free, free, feel free to ask your questions. There is an ask a question button uh, below. So please leave your questions there. And we would love it if you show up and ask it on screen. So please uh, mention if you would be uh, okay for that, or if you don't, uh, if you don't want to be shown on screen or asked to join screen, please just say um, ask for me. But we would really prefer it if you ask for yourself because sometimes we don't get the chance. Um, and yeah, um, with that, also please remember during the talk, uh, ask your uh, clarification questions that you think others can help also in the chat. But if there's a question that you think would be uh, 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 not just clarification, definitely in the ask a question area. Um, I just wanted to say one more thing before we start. Um, on um, February 13th, uh, one of our very dear colleagues from, that I knew back from uh, my postdoc years, Sarah Dubra, who is now a professor at uh, Oregon, uh, passed away. And this has been really difficult uh, to process, not just because of uh, not just for those who are close to her, I think also just for any of the people who knew her academically, because it was just, it feels very unfair. She was just amazing. And um, yeah, take a look at her research. I'll put her name in the chat. Take a look at her research. There are beautiful messages that also um, uh, were shared both in meetings and also on, on the Oregon webpage about her. Um, sometimes it happens that we lose a colleague that we expected our entire career to review each other's work or like, you know, see each other at conferences. And it's quite painful, I have to say. And it was difficult. And I feel like last week I just didn't say anything. And I, I think that the, if I don't share it with you guys, the stress over the course of the three hours of discussion might show up in other ways. So uh, there it is. And um, condolences to anyone to, who is in this forum and was close to Sarah. All right. With that, I'm going <laughs> to pass it on to John and uh, look forward to uh, Jessica's talk. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's always wonderful to introduce our guests. Uh, but this is a very special guest um, in general and for me in particular. Uh, I've known Jessica for about 20 years. Um, Full disclosure, Jessica was my sister-in-law. She was married to my brother, David. Now she's just my sister. Um, uh, so I know Jessica very well. Better. <laughs> Much better. Um, Jessica um, is a professor uh, at the Santa Fe Institute. She's the founding editor of the journal Collective Computation. Uh, she does really fascinating work. Uh, I have to admit that she's one of the people I most enjoy arguing with about science and, let's be honest, everything else. Um, Something you should know about Jessica, um, which is intimidating, uh, but then you get used to it, um, is that there's nothing that she wants to put her mind to that she doesn't want to become a superstar at. So in other words, whether it's, you know, the gym, hiking, surfing, cooking, gardening, you're just going to have to accept that you're going to be left in the dust. Uh, uh, and that's okay. Um, I've gotten used to it. Um, so, extraordinary person, um, fascinated by the humanities, literature, even though a scientist, just the kind of person I do and I love. Um, and it's just great to be able to have Jessica on because she's a singular individual and a scientist, and I'm looking forward to her talk. We have my, can you see my slides? Yes, thank you. Excellent, all right. Well, hello everyone. 
Thanks so much to Ida and John for in inviting me to participate in the salon. Um, by the way, I think this salon is a tremendous public service and um, I so appreciate you guys taking the time to do this, especially during the pandemic. Um, and I absolutely love, you know, that I am participating in this salon with my brother, John, as he put it. Um, he mentioned, uh, he used this word superstar. I think that the key thing there is would like to be, but is nowhere near that in any of those things that he mentioned, you know. So, you know, one can only, one can hope. One can hope and one can work hard and that's about it. Um, so again, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm looking forward to some good discussion. I'm really hoping for some fantastic feedback from Ida and John, from all of you uh, on, on the ideas that, that I'm gonna put on the table. I would like you all to think about my talk as, as a kind of reconciliation. You know, I think, um, as you'll see in a minute, that uh, I'm trying to bring some ideas together that have been sort of um, ideas that have been sort of unfolding in a rather combative space. And I think there's a way, a kind of unification that will possibly, you know, make, make everyone happy. Not that I'm gonna provide that unification, but I think there's a direction we can move in that will resolve some of these issues for sure. So that's why I say it's a reconciliation. So here we have a composite image of the physicist, um, John Wheeler, who's inventor of the phrase, it from bit, and he's at a Princeton blackboard discussing what nature can be quantized. But it's as if he's looking at the, 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 the um, painter Walton Ford's falling bow. And that's a fantastic, if you haven't seen it, depiction of collective behavior. And I'm starting with this slide to sort of set the mood. As you'll see more clearly in a moment, it captures an intersection that's at the center of my research, the intersection of collective phenomena, information processing, core screening, and collective computation. And it provides a kind of important background for today's theme. So in the collective behavior world, as in neuroscience and in and many other areas of biology, there's this longstanding debate about how far down we need to go to predict and explain. And it's become more heated in recent years because a better measurement technology and consequently dramatically increasing availability of, of uh, microscale data as has been nicely discussed by John and Asif and others in this paper. Um, how much of these data should go into our models is one question, but perhaps a better question is how much of this data does nature use? And this slight frame shift is a key theme in all that I do and the stance that I'm gonna take in this salon, and that's to resolve this debate, we need to start thinking from the system's point of view. Okay, so I wanna start with some observations and proposals. And the first observation is this observation that there's disagreement about how far down to go. A lot of disagreement. In collective behavior, are, um, there's, there's sort of the fluid dynamics people who um, are arguing we don't need individual decision-making rules. You know, in neuroscience, do we need all that circuit detail? Do we need to know how complex a neuron is to understand behavior? of the whole organism, all right? So this, this debate's all over the place and it's not new, it's been around for an eternity. And I want to suggest that the, di the disagreement stems from the fact that there's actually variation so far unmeasured across systems in the degree to the degree of collectivity, which we define as screening off of macro from micro. And that there's a failure in the community by all of us to recognize that there's this variation. So some of us work on systems in which macro is screened off and prediction and explanation mostly can reside at the macro scale. And some of us work on systems in which micro scale changes, micro scale changes influence macroscopic behavior on macroscopic relevant time scales. Even though this is the case, I'm going to further suggest that the burden nonetheless is on all of us to show that our macroscopic variables are fundamental, not the result, result of observer bias. In other words, they're derivable from micro. And the burden is on us to measure, to figure out how screened off the macro is. And once we've done these things, then if we like, we can proceed to work largely if, you know, if our system is screened off at the macro scale. And this is what the talk is going to be about. And I want to emphasize that I think these things are particularly important in systems that are heavy on information processing and collective effects. Okay, so before I, I get to how this works, I think this works, I want to step back to gain a synoptic view. So physics is dominated by concepts like pressure, temperature, and entropy, and they emerge through simple interactions providing you know, quite deep insights into the behavior of the physical universe. Now, biology on the other hand, and by that I always mean ecology and society as well, makes use of comparable collective concepts like metabolism, conflict management, robustness, but of course, these are functional properties, right? So in physical systems, orders produced through the minimization of energy, and adaptive systems produce order through the minimization of energy via, and importantly, with varying degrees, information processing and why adaptive systems have this extra step and whether it makes them fundamentally 
um, subjective and uncharacterizable by laws and unamendable to prediction are sort of the big open questions that um, at the Santa Fe Institute we work on it and in many places elsewhere as well. Okay, so let's um, let's pause for a moment. So this would seem to imply that you know energy is the more fundamental, but not everyone, of course, thinks this. Um, you know, if you if you um, you have read the, this Wheeler paper, you know he did not think this. So as you can see more clearly here, um, Wheeler, you know, he's lecturing at his 60th birthday symposium at a Princeton Blackboard. And, and according to a Kip Thorne obituary that was in Science Magazine, I believe, um, he's, the drawing depicts an explorer's quest, an explorer's quest to conquer the great unsolved problems in gravitational physics. And I included it because it's quite a lovely drawing if you look at it closely, and it bears on some of the things that, that I'm gonna hit in this salon. So I'm channeling Wheeler because he proposed in a paper titled, Information Physics in the Quantum, The Search for Links, a paper, by the way, the ideas of which he first presented at the Santa Fe Institute in 1989. He said the following. He said, all things physical are information theoretic in origin, and this is a participatory universe. Observer participatory participancy gives rise to information. He went on to write, it from bit, otherwise put, every it, every particle, every field of force, even the space-time continuum itself, derives its function, its meaning, its very existence entirely, even if in some context indirectly from the apparatus elicited answers to yes, no questions, binary choices. And he goes on later to stress the importance of counting, which sort of takes us back to the information theory perspective. So um, later in the paper, he poses as a central question, and this is a, a question that's at the kind of core of my research interests, the question of collective computation. How does the vision of one world arise out of the information gathering activity of many observer participants? So in some sense, you can think of Wheeler as the founder of collective intelligence. Very interesting. Now, the question suggests that the answer to the energy information conundrum and perhaps to why there's information processing at all lies in our understanding of the relationship of micro to macro and when prediction at the macro scale is possible. Now, these questions, um, I think, are going to be resolved really by focusing on biology, neuroscience, and other areas you know, in, in the study of adaptive systems. But it is useful to turn to the history of physics and namely the debate between thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, because it focuses our attention on what I think are three key questions. The first is, do we observe predictable relationships among macroscopic variables? The ideal gas law is an equation of state in which the amount of gas is determined by its pressure, volume, and temperature. That's an example. Are these macroscopic variables fundamental? Can they be derived from the microscopic? So this was the debate between um, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, right? Are those variables that were being discussed in thermodynamics, are they nominal, observer bias, or are they derivable? And if so, we can say that the relationship among the macroscopic variables are law-like and describe the macroscopic state of the system. Now, the philosopher Hasak Chang in his book, Inventing Temperature, gives his, reading, gives his readers a really deep understanding of how these seemingly clear questions in physics were actually really muddled. And I highly recommend um, reading that book if you haven't done so already. And, um, and now they're, you know, muddled in, in actually much the same way in evolutionary biology and biology more generally. And the crux of the issue was captured um, by actually Mexican surrealist painter and novelist Leonora Carrington, in her, who in her book um, Down Under remarked, to possess a telescope without its essential other half, the microscope, seems to me to be a symbol of the darkest incomprehension. The task of the right eye is to peer into the telescope, while the left eye peers into the microscope. I just love that quote. And she's, of course, emphasizing the importance of seeing and understanding how the very small is connected to the very large. And we might extend her insight to include not just spatial extent, but temporal extent. That is how fast and slow connect and how their relationships between big and small and fast and slow are mediated by the um, relationship between information and energy. Now, returning to social evolution provides an example of the micro to macro model that is, is worth going over for a moment. So, there's a paper published some years ago now by Martin Novak and Karina Tarnita and E.O. Wilson that was really controversial. And then the, you know, the, the sort of, I have to say like the, the paper, the published paper in Nature, wherever it was, was on kin selection and it was kind of problematic, but the appendix is really nice to that paper. And we really like the appendix. And it's because in the appendix, um, they make the point, and I think, you know, this is very much Tarnita doing the derivation. Um, the macroscopic ver variables like R, B, and C in the kin selection models were for a long time implicitly assumed to be fundamental with no attempt to first show that they are justified by deriving them from first principles or micro, in this case, population structure. So before we get to why this derivation is so important, um, beyond the obvious reason of, of showing that a variable is not nominal, 
I think it's worth reviewing one really good example in biology of, of where that relationship has been worked out. So what I have in mind is the, is the scaling work of Jim Brown, of Jeffrey West, Jim Brown, Brian Enquist, Leash, Van Savage, Chris and others, Chris Kempis. And this example serves um, two purposes. It illustrates that deriving micro from macro in biology, macro from micro is possible, can be done, and also why it's important. Okay, so for me, one of the major insights arising from this work is that when information processing and collective effects become important, the scaling law changes. It's, it's, it's a different kind of scaling law. And so what we have here um, is when energy dominates, as in the case of scaling of mass and metabolic, right? That's the elephant um, picture. Um, there's an economy of scale. So the average elephant weighs 220,000 times as much as the mouse, but only eats about 10,000 um, times as much energy in the form of calories as the mouse. In contrast, in social systems, the analog to mass and metabolic rate, something like population size and patent generation, scale scales super linearly. There's an increasing return to scale. Now, the metabolic scaling relationships have been with, there's some controversy, controversy around this, but basically they've been derived from first mechanistic principles and relating to the fractal structure of energy distribution networks. So we sort of know the micro to macro mapping. It's under um, development in the, in the social system case. We don't know what the right input is. We don't know what the right macroscopic variables are. They have like 40 they're considering. There obviously needs to be some dimensionality reduction, um, but that works in progress. But what I want to emphasize is that in information processing systems, in collective systems, the scaling is different. Information seems to change things. Okay, now let me re-emphasize this point. So in my opinion, the, the distance, the difference isn't really uh, between um, biological and social systems as those slides suggest, but between information processing systems that are dominated by energy constraints versus those that have a lot of information processing as well. All right, now I think in systems with information processing, with a lot of information processing, this making this micro to macro map is, is even more challenging. So I have here a slide, uh, you know, starting to get at why. So just consider for the moment, the fact that the human body has 38 trillion bacterial cells, 30 trillion self cells. And of course, you know, 86 or 200 billion of these are neural cells. There's 8.6 million people in, in New York city. So there's this incredible hierarchy with, um, uh, you know, all of this, all of these, these big numbers. Um, and yeah, we carry around in our heads these, these kind of ideas that the microscale or lower levels are simpler than, than the so-called higher levels. So a cell, for example, is just a blob of cytoplasm with some smaller blobs, organelles floating around in it. Now this just isn't true. And we all know this by now not to be true, but I feel we've collectively failed to process it. And this is gonna come up a couple of times in the talk. So, you know, there's the numbers issue. If you just look at this drawing from, um, you know, smart biology, and there's some, been some beautiful whole cell models published this year, um, the macro molecular co um, composition of a typical cell is like 3 million proteins, 260,000 RNAs, two DNA molecules, 20 million lipids, and so on, right? A lot of, a lot of big numbers there. Um, but there's also a lot of structure. There's a lot of, it's not just complicated, it's complex. So, and even simple prokaryotes like bacteria have complex internal structure and um, functionality now. They can do nutrient digestion, synthesize molecules. The neuron, you know, which, uh, you know, obviously many people here are, are, work on, are experts on, has, you know, is one of the most mechanically complica complex cells in the body with a thousand to 10,000 synapses, 50 billion proteins. It can compute, some neurons can compute now, um, you know, empirically demonstrated in the last year or two, um, XOR functions, right? So, the point is, is that estimating regularities in such complex environments is non-trivial. And it seems like error and bias information processing is occurring at all scales. That's an issue, by the way, that's not worked out. There is there is some work asking when information processing is optimal, but it's like by Bill, Bill Bialik and others, but there's just not enough on, on this question. So it seems like, um, you know, information processing, there's all this complexity at the micro scale. Information processing is bound to be error prone. We seem to have a lot of evidence that it is. But like I said, still an open question. And, you know, it comes back to this observ observation of Wheeler, his observation that information gathering rests on the perceptual abilities of his participants. So why this is important and, um, and you know, what implications this has is now what, what I want to turn to. And given all of this variability, you know, one might think that it's amazing that there are ordered states at all, right? I mean, we all know that noise um, can be critical to generating ordered states and amplifying signal. And, um, and now we're all familiar with the idea that biological systems are, are mostly out of equilibrium, but they do have multiple time and space scales. And it's precisely that multiplicity of time and space scales that allows biology to recover 
what might be called um, effective equilibrium states. So properties of social structure, for example, persist um, compared to the lifespan, lifespan of components and component behavior fluctuates. And so the key to understanding in such systems, um, how particular social structures arise from individual action, interactions, for example, I think lies in the following proposal. Components as imperfect information processors do error prone coarse graining. We're gonna talk about what that is and to compensate collectively compute their macroscopic world, sometimes recovering ground truths and sometimes creating new ones if they fail to collectively wash out the noise. And this collective computation to channel Wheeler um, means that for prediction and control, we need to consider the system's point of view. So it's possible to produce ordered states in biological systems, and obviously they do, um, that not only make sense from an endogenous point of view and are a poor weak fit to the environment, but of course, at some point, you know, energy comes back in and, you know, riffing on um, Chinua, Chibi, riffing on Yeats, Yeats, things fall apart. But it may be precisely the, these transitions, these transitory states that make up much of the interesting complexity in biology. So we don't want to dismiss them, or at least I don't. So to reiterate some of the points that I've been making, information processing introduces subjectivity. And consequently, a natural question is to ask how nature overcomes subjectivity generated during information processing to produce ordered states. Our proposals adaptive systems do this by combining component coarse grains to, to identify endogenous or exogenous problems and collectively find or compute solutions to them in EVA learning time. Now, um, in the collective uh, behavior literature, as John and Asif and, and their collaborators mentioned in their paper, complexity from simplicity or simple rules is often stressed. And you see this, you see this all over the place. You see it in the CA work, you see it in the evolution of development. It's it's the kind of meme. And I want to I want to say that I want to um, really hammer home the point that it's wrong. Why is it wrong? It's wrong for the reasons that I already told you. There's incredible complexity at the micro scale. What happens is that the micro scale, there are simple rules in many systems, but nature has to do a lot of work to find them. And we've sort of skipped that part of the problem. And so we need to really, you know, start focusing on that. Much of the problem I, I want to suggest it lies in figuring out how nature figures out what the simple rules are and whether it gets them right. And once we understand that, we'll, I think, understand emergence way better than we do at present. Now, let me spend a few minutes on coarse graining. So what is coarse graining? So, you know, I mean, let's start with uh, a kind of an analogy. So here we've got Mondrian's, um, you know, tree series. And coarse graining is essentially just capturing the essence of a thing or a process by putting out of focus the irrelevant details. Now, why is this important? Well, the second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of the universe is increasing. And as it does, at least some of the detailed information that we initially had about the system is lost, making difficult prediction of behavior. Now, additionally, classical fluctuations at the micro scale, like that small, fast time scale, non-directional changes in component behavior can make reliance on microscopic behavior for macroscopic prediction difficult. And ideally, we'd like our prediction to be based on a compact, if we're you know, theoretically minded, description of system behavior. So for these reasons, to make good predictions, we can move to this coarse grain description, in which some of that microscopic detail is smoothed out. Temperature is an example. And for the you know, sake of time, I won't go through my um, little temperature story. You can, you can read that in Hasek Chang's book if you're interested. But what we want is, uh, is to sort of understand um, what's in physics and biology uh, called an effective theory. It, an effective theory allows us to model behavior system without spe specifying all the underlying causes. And, and it's by definition agnostic actually to underlying causes and can sometimes even get them wrong. There's some beautiful examples of that. Um, but, but, you know, coarse graining is one route to building an effective theory and a, a route I like because it has a basis in mechanism, which is helpful when the world changes because an understanding of mechanism can provide guidance on how to update. Now, Having a, a basis in mechanism is this critical property of coarse grain, a, co a good coarse grain description. It's true to the system. It's a simplification of the microscopic details, but it doesn't introduce any outside information to the subset of the microscopic interactions over which it's performed. This is a lossy but true property, and it distinguishes coarse graining from other types of abstraction, something that we might talk about later. And I think there's a lot of issues in there about how we update and whether we use coarse grain. Okay. So obviously, you know, an average is a simple example. There's obviously more complicated coarse grain computations you can do, and we'll talk about them later. The main point I want to emphasize now is that there's a huge body of work in physics, you know, relating to renormalization group theory on how to coarse grain. And now there are bio physicists working in biology who are trying to coarse grain biological systems. 
Um, and normally when we talk about coarse, coarse graining, we mean this. We mean coarse grainings that we as scientists impose on the system to find compact descriptions. However, we can also ask how adaptive systems identify regularities and build effective theories to guide decision making. And my colleagues and I, to distinguish these two types of coarse grainings, one that may be wrong and error prone, the bio biological example, um, call that endogenous coarse graining. Okay, so a sort of motivation of our work is to understand how biological systems and their parts or centers compute these coarse grainings. And the question is part of a much larger effort to lay the groundwork for a formal language of computation in biological systems. And I'm not gonna talk about that today. I'm just gonna focus on the bits of this that are relevant to the theme of the salon, and in particular, the question of how far down do we need to go? So on this slide, it just provides some you know, rudimentary basics or guidance that's required to understand the next couple of slides. So um, you know, just quickly, the input, by that I mean regularities perceived by components through coarse graining and the consequent behavior, the output some macroscopic property, ideally a functional one. The algorithm here is like a procedure set of steps for specifying how information flows over a strategy circuit. You'll see an example of that in a minute. Aggregating individual coarse grainings and mapping the input to output in biologically relevant time. And we don't need to really talk about the notion of correctness today, but we can in the discussion if, you, if you'd like to touch on that. Okay, so, um, I don't want to go over the next couple of slides in really any detail. I'm just trying to give you a, a glimpse of how we build these micro to macro maps and information processing systems where you have to take the system's point of view. So how, you know, what does it mean to do that seriously? So we think it means for us, it's study, studying how regularities in complex systems emerge is essential to understanding how the components of these systems perceive and compute regularities in their environment. And it means that while we're in the early days of studying how nature coarse grains, we need to rely on bottom up in inductive approaches rather than deductive ones since we don't yet know what the information processing principles are. So in the inductive approaches that we've developed, we extract strategies and decision rules from data. Um, and we then study how the strategies, so these are empirically grounded strategies, how they combine to produce a collective or macroscopic outputs. Now, of course, this is already, I put it in my own words, but this is already really the modus operandi in systems biology and systems neuroscience. And to some degree, um, you know, there's as there's a quite a bit of work, you know, in those areas on biological circuits that are underpinning cellular, neural, and you know, whole organism outputs. But here are two two examples of from very different systems. One on the left, or this this the social circuit, comes from my own work, and the other is a gene regulatory network from Eric Davis and his collaborators. And so, you know, basically the idea is that is that the the nodes are you know components or individuals. And in, in my work in this particular circuit, they're um, pairs and and singletons. Um, and the edges give the probability that uh, an individual plays a particular strategy in a, in a social context. In this case, it's a decision rule an individual has to join a fight based on what happened in the previous fight and who was in it. And they're so probabilistic, so these are stochastic circuits. So there are different ways to you know, get these circuits from data. In the Eric Davison case, the, the methods are very different from the ones that we've developed, but the, but the idea is basically the same. You, you, you circumscribe in advance a set of biologically principled set of strategies. You search these, um, for these biologically principled strategies, ideally in time series data, the ones you find evidence for, you use to build circuits that describe how the microscopic behavior of the components combines to produce some macroscopic output. In the social case, it's a distribution of fight sizes, which has consequences for individuals because large fights cost more. And the, and the circuits, you get a sort of family of circuits um, that um, specify different ways in which the strategies might combine to produce the macroscopic output. So here you see um, from the social case, an example of, of a family of circuits that we get. And the circuits are all hypotheses for how, for the micro macro and map, for their empirically grounded hypotheses for how the strategies the individuals are using to make decisions in a social context combine to produce a macroscopic output, like the distribution of fight sizes or another one with distribution of power. Um, so you can think about the simulated circuits as these um, hypotheses for hardware. Um, where decision rules are combining and there's an information aggregation algorithm that operates the simulation steps is a simple example here to produce the the output now of course and i'm, and I'm coming um, to the how far down do we go section in just a minute of course um, these circuits are extremely complex and channeling you know bohr has not the best maps of the world they don't really help us understand much so um, to get a simplified mapping we have to do some dimensionality reduction we, because we're 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 always channeling, we're always trying to figure out how the nature's doing this, how the systems do this themselves. We are trying to find biologically principled dimension reduction. 
So it's not just the best dimension reduction, it's the biologically principled dimension reduction, given what we know about the um, computational capacity of the system, the data it actually sees and so forth, um, to build a family of compact coarse grained mesoscale circuits, each of which is again a hypothesis for that micro to macro mapping. And we run them again forward in simulation to see what best recovers our observables. So that's the basic you know, workflow. Um, and, you know, I, I, uh, this isn't so important. I'll skip this part. And so out of this, we get, um, you know, we distill what we think of as the kind of architecture for um, how biological systems might be doing their computations. And over here on, on this slide, we have the Ws. So the Ws are the perceivable states of the world. So again, very much systems point of view perspective here. And they can be exogenous ground truths like the height of the Eiffel Tower or something that's endogenous to the system, a computed variable, but one that changes slowly once it's computed. So it makes a background or an environment. And the Xs are the nodes on the microscopic circuit and they have like opinions or strategies based on their coarse grainings of W. The Ys are the macroscopic coarse grainings resulting from from um, the aggregations over the X's. So um, the X's are like doing their computations of how the world works. They're coming out with coarse grained representations of how the world works. Those coarse grains are combined and produce Y. And then Y um, influences the X's, allowing them um, to produce new behavior or behavior Z, right? So this is unfolded in time. And this is our little um, uh, architecture for how we think computation might work in biology. And, um, one of the things that I want to emphasize now is uh, what we think happens as a result of this process, which should, should be implicit in what I've said, but I'm gonna make it explicit now. When the axes do their quartz graining, they're finding those simple rules that the collective behavior takes for granted. They're coming out with effective theories for how the world works. So there's a there's a, an information bottleneck in the, in the quartz grains that axes are doing on the Ws that, um, that gives them uh, uh, the regularities in the world. And one of the questions is, when are these regularities good? How good do they have to be, right? Those are open questions. And we think what this allows is what we're calling a macroscopic expansion. So, you know, we see this happening over and over again. And in in doing the coarse graining, which is, you know, you're, is lossy, so we have fewer degrees of freedom and, you know, information is lost, but in another sense, information's gained. The X's are gaining information about what the right strategies are given how the world works. They're gaining information about where to invest their time, how to, how to refine their behavior. And what we've observed in our own work, and I don't have time to go through any of the you know, basis for this, is that this allows them, changes the cost function for behaviors, and it allows them to engage in or access new strategies that they couldn't access before they did the course screen. All right, so that's why we're talking about a macroscopic expansion. And I don't really have time to go into this today. It's like a whole nother talk, but we're calling this kind of emergence hourglass emergence. It takes seriously macro scale complexity. It takes seriously how nature finds the simple rules. And it takes seriously what the consequences of the simple rules are for, for um, subsequent behavior. Okay, so now um, going forward, I'm coming to the end here. Um, you know, thinking through these issues has, you know, hopefully unsurprisingly led my collaborators and I to, to what to I think one of the most interesting questions um, out there, and that's how to formalize ontological shifts in biological systems from cases in which macro prediction requires micro information to those cases in which macro is effectively screened off from micro and you get these law-like relationships at the macro scale, like the ideal gas law, to, to um, return to the start of the talk. So this is just to you know reiterate, micro is informing macro behavior in macro relevant time or macro macro is mostly what matters. And I, and I call this, and it's you know very preliminary work, but I call this idea channel switching in the information theoretic sense. Um, so to make it a little bit more concrete, now I've gone on this slide, I'm, I need to redo all the notation here, obviously, but um, so I just made this this morning so I can make this point, but we've got macroscopic variable one and macroscopic variable two. So the channel switches is when to understand how the Y's influence each other, um, you need the micro scale versus in uh, a case where you can just reside, you know, largely do your prediction and explanation at the macro scale, which I think is what John is interested in. You know, when is that the case? Okay, so let's see. Now, um, by coincidence, well, not really by coincidence, but I read broadly and I was reading the work of a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, James O'Dwyer, last year um, in ecology. And he wrote this beautiful paper with his postdoc, Mario Muscarella, a paper I just love, that actually addressed this issue really nicely, but 
they were doing uh, they're doing the paper for other reasons. But, you know, it, it's just a perfect example of what I'm saying. So let me just um, spend my last minute or so on this. And that's um, that, that's this model they built. They wanted to understand um, interspecies competition. And, you know, typically there are sort of consumer resource based models and there's like locked up Altera type models that are that are more macroscopic. And what they did is they creatively they creatively address this um, coarse graining issue. They built a coarse grain model of species cellular uh, metabolic processes, which are normally not included, you know, in in um, in models of interspecies competition. And they asked whether the coarse grain behavior, you know, of uh, so it's empirically grounded coarse graining, it, you know, has a basis and mechanism, um, influences interspecies behavior like competitions and mutualisms, behaviors that are usually treated entirely at the macro scale. And specifically, they showed using this empirically grounded coarse grain metabolic model. Um, the surprising result that weaker competitors in competition at the macro scale can be sustained in a population, excuse me, due to properties of metabolic ne networks one level down. So in other words, the micro scale behavior usually assumed to be screened off, the you know, or not influencing in species species interactions is in fact relevant to macro scale interactions. But to see this effect, the micro scale had to be properly coarse grained with, you know, real, with some real, re real details included. And in exa this example illustrates to me how careful thinking about co how, co how collective a system is can in a very real way influence model and theory building. And among the many questions I think this work begs is one, how much variation is there across biological systems and screening off to come back again to the beginning of the talk? Could systems in which macro scale prediction seems not to require a micro scale info be improved with good coarse grain descriptions of the microscale dynamics, coarse grain descriptions that are um, that are uh, developed by taking the system's point of view into account, I think so. Okay, so to summarize um, what I what I've sort of proposing in this talk, collectivity is foundationally is about how screened off the macro scale is from its constituents, such that in the limit of maximum screening off, no recourse to the micro scale is necessary, obviously over some time scale, um, for prediction at the macro scale. And showing this, I, I'm suggesting, requires three conditions. First, demonstrating that the macroscale variables are fundamental and not nominal. That is, they can be derived from the microscopic. And that this is particularly critical in systems where information processing is important because it distorts things through error and bias. Okay, so we have to take on the system's point of view in such cases. Second, it requires showing that there's statistical evidence for law-like relationships among a set of macroscopic variables, like the mass and um, scaling sublinearly with metabolic rate in mammals. Now, uh, a, a counterintuitive statement that's, you know, also a very preliminary one, um, but maybe worth discussing because I think its implications are very interesting, is how clean the law is, you know, that is like the importance of the residuals, might also be an indicator of how screened off the system is. And I think that's counterintuitive because I, I suspect that the sort of intuitive conclusion here is that if the scaling relationships can really be derived from first principles strongly, that that means the, the macro is not screened off from the micro, but I want to suggest that actually it means that it is. So that's a little tricky and we can come back to that. So finally, um, it requires measuring how sensitive, and I didn't talk much about, I didn't really talk any at all about this today, how sensitive these relationships are to microscopic perturbations. And I did talk about this in James's work and whether macro macro prediction is improved with micro info. So th to make a long story short, I'm saying that these conditions two and three capture the degree to which the macro scale is screened off from the micro scale and hence its degree of collectivity. And I think this can be formalized and something I'm starting to think about with my group. I think it can be formalized information theoretically, much like um, we formalized uh, what an individual is information theoretically. I think it's, it's quite similar idea. Um, and I further want to suggest, oh, that's it. Okay, I think I'm done. Yep, good. Thank you so much, this was awesome. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I think that the style of your presentation is extremely enjoyable. And uh, I don't know if you were reading from something, but I'd love to read it <laughs> like if, if, if it was written. It was really fantastic. Um, I want to invite everyone to thank the speaker and also to please share your questions. And obviously, we always have some questions. And um, John, do you want to go first or should I go first? Whatever you want, um, I'm happy to go first. I can ask some things, and then maybe I'll I'll come back in. And also, Jeff, do you want to um, stop share screen sharing?
So something, that, oh, and then there is a delay between us uh, speaking and being live. So the hand, you see the, the audience is now just showing there. Um, we're seeing it now, basically. Um, so I really appreciated this. I particularly appreciated the way that you started um, with a, uh, the way I understood it, with a kind of a um, critical physics perspective. So not just exactly treating everything the way that, uh, you know, just applying exactly physics to biology, but you actually took into consideration the similarities of complexity at the collective and sort of submolecular level and I, or, or subcellular level. And I really appreciated that. I think that um, that's rarely done this well. And when you were talking in the end and your end slide about there being law-like relationships at the macro level, it really reminded me of this idea of special sciences, uh, that um, is the idea of irreducibility of sciences like economics and psychology mm -hmm. to physics. And I hadn't seen such uh, it, it put in a way that you did. And I feel like the the best work I had known that it would come to my mind it was always that. And it's so lovely that uh, uh, that's why I was thinking, which where did you, if, if I can find somewhere to read this, because I feel like it would be great to reference it. Um, and I really appreciated that you had a kind of a micro macro scale in a way defined the relationship that it can be applied hierarchically or multi-scale level. It doesn't need to be too. And it allows for theorizing computationally and experimentally at all levels, potentially with similar rules, which is what I like a lot, because for me, it's always a sort of uh, that's exactly the thing that um, in, interests me, the kinds of algorithms that work at explaining macro and micro level, both, for instance. Um, I did have a couple of questions. For instance, I wonder about the objective, uh, objective function of collective computation as opposed to computation at the level of an individual versus computation at the level of a circuit level in the brain. So for, for instance, if you look at computation that happens at a circuit level in my brain, it's not um, it's only doing some particular thing locally usually, or it's broadcasting something globally to other places, or it's integrating from various ones, right? And then whatever happens, there is a person level that uh, has a kind of a narrative structure and uh, sort of reasons, uh, works in the world and explains things and the causes for behavior, not in terms of this is what the circuit in my hippocampus did, but in terms of, oh, I remembered my mom and therefore bought these flowers that she liked, right? And so, uh, and then there is the collective level, which is, um, you know, uh, we are uh, scientists who have dedicated kind of our lives in spite of the challenges in pursuit of certain ideas and testing them and talking to each other about it all the time. Um, so that being said, I do wonder like when the cell is doing a computation, the objective function of that cell is a little easier to define. When a person is making some deficient, uh, some decisions, because we are at that person level, uh, objectives of that person for that decision are a little bit easier to define. Collective objectives are a little bit more difficult to define and also evolutionary objectives are even more difficult to define because it can't be that it's just about survival of the species because then there is a lot of variations and then there is a lot of, you know, is it the age? No, because there are some species that live a lot longer than others. So it's, um, I, I, what I'm trying to say is that it seems like defining the objective function, the more higher level we go, the more macro level we go, is more difficult. So I wonder if you wanted to, let's say, uh, give an account of this kind of micro macro interactions, let's say with an um, algorithm, algorithmic approach of reinforcement learning, just because that's something I do, an example. What would it's easy for me to imagine what would be the objective of a single cell organism, but it's very difficult for me to imagine or a cell. Uh, it's very difficult for me to imagine what. Uh, okay, it's also easy to imagine what's the function of a circuit in the brain, but the whole individual it's a little bit harder. Like, what's the objective of an entire life? Like uh, the life scale of an individual, and at a more macro level. What's the uh, computation, collective computation objective that a particular group of monkeys that you have done or a particular group of humans do? And then, you know, generations, what is the objective function going on there? I think it becomes more difficult. So I would, wanted to hear what you might have, and you probably have thoughts about it. So general question out there. Okay, should I answer the question now? 
Yeah. Okay. So the first thing I would say is that I think this point you made about narrative, one can make again at all scales. So I see that interpretation, that story that we lay over things, as um as essentially a con. It's 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 what I, I wrote an article a while ago called um course screening is a downward causation mechanism. And I would say that when the components of a system are reading off the collective course screens that the system's producing, they're when they're reading them, making estimates of them, they're essentially doing that narrative thing. Maybe that's a provocative statement, but I actually think it's not that mysterious. I, I, the, the mystery part comes in the second part of your question, which is the you're, you're suggesting the objective function gets more difficult as we sort of move up and to the whole organism level, for example. So I want to break that down a little bit because um, one of the, some of you may have noticed that, you know, um, in the case of the distribution, and if you've heard me give other talks and even the physics example at the beginning, in the biology case, I'm often talking about one macroscopic variable, the distribution of flight size, and the collective computation of that variable from, from the microscopic. And for me, the collective computation includes both the sensor's computation of coarse screenings of environmental regularities, which involves another collective computation one step down, and the circuits and the algorithms that operate on them to aggregate those opinions of how the world works, those coarse screenings. So those two steps, right, the sensor co coarse screening and the collective coarse screening by the components in the circuits. That's collective computation and it happens, I think, all the way down. Um, but in because of you know what tractability in this work that we've done, we focus usually on one macroscopic variable and the collective computation of that variable. And any social system in in in, in, in for the behavior of any organism, there's multiple interacting macroscopic variables. Right. And in the physics case, the case of the ideal gas law, you've got, you know multiple macroscopic variables, and then you got the macroscopic state of the system. And we're sort of simplifying the whole thing by looking at one at a time. And one of the things that we need to do, and this gets to your complexity question, is start looking at, looking at the computation of, you know, the micro, what the microscopic configuration is that allows the computation of these multiple interacting macroscopic variables. We haven't really done that yet. We, we have looked a little bit at, we often look at macroscopic variables and how they feed back on the system. We haven't looked so much at their relationship. We looked at macroscopic variables in one system and how that influences another system. And James and the James O'Dwyer work I mentioned, that, that's the case there. But considering multiple macroscopic variables at once, which I think is maybe what John also wants, and, and where the macroscopic for systems where they're screening off prediction becomes macro macro prediction becomes useful is definitely something we need to do. It's very hard. Uh, I want to challenge the idea a little bit though, Ida, that um, the algorithms and um, the aggregation that goes on in a cellular circuit is less complex than in a human one. I think we don't know that. They what where where what might be true is that the cellular in a cellular circuit there are fewer macroscopic functions, right? That might be true, but I I there's no reason I think to believe yet that the the aggregation there, given especially how complex cells are, is any simpler than it is. It might even be more complicated or more complex than say at the human social network level. So that so that's a that's an issue, but I do think as we go up, we do potentially get more functions. So I would add that the, thank you so much for that. So what I said that it seems to be easier is the objective function of the cell. So for instance, let's say the cell has to preserve a particular uh, metabolic, uh, uh, let's say equilibrium and whatnot, and a neuron might need to do a certain thing. The objective function of a neuron or a cell, I was saying is easier, not the algorithms, but just the objective function. And I think that when we talk about macro scale, something that may, uh, maybe I have in mind is uh, also macro scale and temporality. I like that uh, both in terms of uh, in neuroscience, computer science, and also I've been reading this fantastic book that actually sometimes we show the share the books that we're reading. It's called In the Meantime, Temporality and Cultural po Politics, and it considers the different sort of uh, spheres of temporality. So it could be that, for instance, during the uh, 4 to 6 a.m., people who uh, clean the streets have the, uh, uh, the power on the streets, basically. Uh, from 12 to 3 a.m., it could be, you know, drunken youth that have the power on the streets. From 9 to 5, maybe the uh, the example it gives is the businessman that ha that defined the rules of the streets and during that time, right? So the point that they're trying to make is that also the macro level at the society it also depends on, on temporalities. Mm -hmm. So what I was trying to think it was in terms of extended temporalities, things that are around extended temporalities, that macro level and micro level to some extent become harder for objective functions to define. Mm 
So for instance, even on one individual at the scale of its life, the objective function is difficult to define. I understand that Darwin might say, oh, survival of the fittest. So it just wants to create as many of, uh, offspring as possible. I don't think most of us think of the objective function of life like that, but um, yeah. It would be interesting to see for extended temporalities what it is. Again, for the collective, I totally agree with you. If you're looking at the effect of one parameter on the structure or number of monkeys in a fight or the, the social computation that the fights may do in terms of who becomes the alpha male or something like that, that might be uh, temporally more um, constrained than, for instance, what's the collective computation of the species doing? Is it trying to maintain it? Is it trying to protect it against other species? Do we also conceive of this collective entity as a unit now? Because uh, the coarse graining, I really liked that. The way that sometimes we talk about humanity or the human race, like we coarse grain it a lot. Or when we talk about species as one entity, we are basically coarse graining the entire entity. So likewise, I'm thinking about the objective functions of these different entities. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that, that that's, I think, is a little more difficult. So, but let me just make a one remark, and that is uh, one of the things we're very interested in is, um, so we've done a lot of work on the origins and maintenance of time scales and why biological systems are, have multiple time and space scales. We worked a little less on time, uh, less on space and more on time, but uh, we think that one of the computations biological systems are doing is um, the ideal separation of time scales between levels, and they're computing the slow variables too. So. Um, there's there there again it comes back to taking the systems point of view they're resolving this temporal this temporal question that you raise themselves by creating by by sort of um tuning that time scale separation so i think to answer your question again we have to take the systems point of view and ask about relevant time scales and how those are influenced by what can be tuned in the system yes exactly thank you for saying that and i appreciate that it's a part of the ideal separation of time scale the way you put it it's a great way to put it I still wonder, what would be your guess? If you wanted to, let's say, design a, a kind of an algorithm that is going to have minimum amount of, like, you know, coarse grain um, evolution, like, what would you put as the objective of, a, of, of one, individual, one individual agent's life? So all of its life, though, not just the neurons that created in one moment. You know what I mean? And what would you put the objective at? Basically, what I'm trying to get at is uh, objective. What would be the objective function for the, our computational models for computation at the evolutionary scale? Well, I mean, can I, can I be flip and say maximize beauty? No, I mean, uh, <laughs> the, um, I, I don't know how to answer that question. I, I say that we're interested in the idea that, um, and it comes back to the termination criterion notion of correctness that I, I didn't go over at all. We're interested in the idea that you can reformulate evolutionary dynamics and information theoretically in terms of mutual information and its variance. And, um, and so the system has lots of different objective functions given where it is in its life cycle or you know, developmental stage. And, um, and it's trying to essentially um, maximize mutual information with the environment, the environment that it deems to be currently important, right? And so um, that's the way I think about it. And I think, you know, the objective function that the organism is trying to solve is going to be understood by sort of moving into the problem that way, instead of, instead of asking the question sort of first of, of what objective function is the organism trying to solve, I would ask, what can it solve? Like right. in, principle, in principle, given, you know, what it can do and what is it solving well, right? So when I say, what can it solve, it's like, Given you know the constraints that the system um, that are in place in the system, given its computational capacity and the kind of data it has access to, what what um, what objective functions can it solve, and and how well is it solving them? If it, it could it solve them better if it had say global perspective, or you know, and, and I think there is a lot of evidence for a kind of global perspective in biology more than most people think. Um, but or could it solve them better if it had more data, or could it solve them better if its if its sensors had more computational capacity? Right, so I think we're asking questions at, the, at a very different level. Um, so because, right, so you're not thinking about creating an algorithm that uh, does that kind of, um, that, uh, that, or creating agents that evolve based on similar computations than biological agents. I think that's the question that I'm asking. Like what would be the objective function to have agents evolve based on similar uh, principles. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it's like a design question. Yeah, exactly. And I think that what you're saying is a how question once we have these agents. It's like assuming these agents are, right? Am I understanding correctly? Yeah, no, I, I think so. And I, I have another sort of a very different take on that is, um, uh, so one of the, a new area at SFI we're calling emergent engineering. And it's a design mm -hmm. element. And, you know, it's kind of in response to COVID and some of these other, you know, it's in, it's in response to 9-11 where you get like this incredibly laser-like response to the last bad thing that happened. <laughs> and, you know, it's very outcome oriented. Yeah. Very outcome oriented. So let's, let, let's solve this problem. And so, you know, in the kind of like self-organization, collective intelligence tradition, that's a bit weird, right? So instead of focusing on outcomes, and I, you know, I've done a lot of work in robustness and robustness is another example of this. Instead of focusing on, on outcomes, focus on process. Right on, you know, on on what generates robustness. How sloppy can you be ar around some target, you know, and still get by? You know, it's kind of a, a satisfying argument. And so, from the design perspective, we've been trying to kind of harness these ideas and 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 um, use them to use them to generate come up with novel ways of designing systems so that they're they're less outcome oriented and more about um, finding solutions to unexpected crises, ones that you can't necessarily plan for. And that's that's what we mean by emergent engineering, where you're sort of harnessing collective intelligence in the moment when this sort of distribution of environmental states that seems to have fundamentally changed to find a new solution. And it, it's, um, you know, it's not, we're, and I think the robustness work and some of the collective, intel, collective computation work in nature suggests that to some extent this is going on, that you're not always trying to like tie down a specific target target outcome but you're sort of you're designing for robustness you're designing for um creative uh, evolvable solutions you know how and, and i guess the question you're asking is is um what, what are you trying to solve <laughs> the, it, i think it i think the design principle actually is the emergent engineering right it's it's I see, not i see your point yeah i see your point very well and i think this is an important moment because this is where uh, like emergent dynamics differ very much from uh, reinforcement learning, for instance, where you define an objective and the processes just uh, happen or emerge as a result of that uh, telos, if you want, as opposed to like, uh, sorry, like it's, it is exactly, it's a little teleological in the RL domain, maybe the emergence of things is driven by some objective at the end, whereas you're saying, no, in this case, it's not something teleological that's driving it. You're seeing it as there are some processes. And just because these processes were helpful, like how to be more robust or uh, create um, create uh, create uh, creative solutions in case something changes in the world. And everything that happens is as a result of that. So it's more like a bottom up as opposed to a top down view on uh, the emergent objectives we might be imagining. Yeah, I mean, with the caveat, though, of course, that nature often designs control structures that are centralized and look top down, right? And, yeah. And I see that in my own work. So sometimes that is the right solution. And sort of the question is, like, can we design a system that can move more fluidly between this emergent engineering, bottom up where, you know, process to um, a more top down control state? You know, when we have an idea of what the microscopic configuration, the space of microscopic configurations is to solve a particular, maybe well understood problem. Interesting. So it's a kind of to be very provocative, and I'm not in no fan a sense of social credit systems, but it would be like moving to a social credit system under certain types of crises and then having mechanisms that allow us to move fluidly back out of that. Interesting. Um, that's interesting. The reason I'm saying that constantly interesting because so in the reinforcement learning condition, you have the bottom up thing, too where some simple objective uh, is defined and everything else happens bottom up, but things emerge out of it, for instance, right? Based on some principles of learning and then some objective for this, uh, apply, these principles are applied to. Um, what do you think about learning in the domain of this approach of emergent uh, sort of uh, dynamics and emergent engineering? What's the role of learning? Like how, how an organism comes to learn how to solve a problem and how, how it comes to learn those processes, the way that, for instance, we study in humans or rodents. I think learning's critical. And so, you know, I think what, um, one thing that's happening is uh, updating um, your course grainings, uh, is how the course grainings converge and what role learning plays in that. 
So, you know, initially, you know, you have agents or individuals looking at the world and they're going to have different course screenings, depending, of course, on what environments, how much of the environment they've seen is shared and how similar their computational capacities are. And one of the things we're interested in is, you know, how they how those course screenings converge and what role learning plays and how that feeds back on itself to push the convergences even further. Um, and I think coming back to the sort of time scale point, the time scale separation point, that you know, it's not it's not that you want everyone to have the same core screenings because because then the system is very sort of distributed and not very evolvable. And so there's there are all these trade offs here, but I, learning seems I think learning is key. I'm not I, I think I'm not sure if you know if I'm, I'm adding anything particularly insightful right now to the learning question. I, I guess coming back to your earlier point about um, the objective function reinforcement learning, I think an interesting issue is whether you can think about um, robustness as and allowing for like sloppy variation around some target is consistent with that view or if it if it is a somewhat different view but I think that's the objective that's your objective so if I wanted to translate what you're saying into an RL framework it seems like evolvability we can define some objective for testing evolvability and robustness are the two objectives that you have defined so you this would be at a long-term evolutionary so if I was training a meta learner Mm -hmm. And the meta learner was testing out different parameters, uh, like uh, learning from, uh, let's say, a distribution of a thousand or a million parameters across mm -hmm. different parts of the species. The meta learner would gradually, for instance, learn that a particular part of this distribution is more evolvable or um, robust to change, and that one is going to survive emerge just over time. The difference being, for your version, that will that would have to emerge. In our version, it's the objective, and then driven by this objective things will have to emerge like the evolvability and robustness because it seems like those are the objectives that you define or the minimum objectives that you defined right I, I think so I mean one other piece to this might be that you know often in the collective intelligence world one is thinking about the simple example is how to estimate the you know the weight of a steer going back to Galton right I mean a really trivial example but uh, you know in the collective computation case errors that components make and and the opinions of components that they're you know getting as a result of the computations they make and and how that's informed by learning are informative. So another view of kind of collective intelligence is that um, is not to not to um, figure out while well, looking at the sort of wisdom of the crowd to figure out what the right solution is, but to figure out what the problems are. Right. So failures or or even if you think about like the U.S. elections, this is an example I like to give. If you think about why um, individuals in certain places vote for certain candidates? We often dismiss that, you know, as um, as a, as, a, as a problem with the electoral system, especially candidates who are really problematic. But I think it actually is informative. It, it's telling us something. It's a kind of collective intelligence. It's telling us about something in the system that needs to be fixed or improved. It's revealing problems that that need to be addressed. And so um, I wonder how that fits into your RL framework. I love what you're saying because I actually do have some work on, um, for instance, how certain things might, um, uh, certain kinds of inequalities will increase over time if agents are interacting with each other while some group uh, is just, there is just like a disparity of distribution between them. And both groups are equally likely to, let's say, give some negative feedback to each other. And as the dynamics are, the more unequal the dynamics in the beginning are after 1,000 iterations of their interactions, the inequalities are going to get worse, basically. Mm -hmm. And so I do definitely believe in system level analysis. And I do think the learning uh, parameters really help with that because that's a little bit like learning. Basically, those who have more resources would learn over time that, hey, these things work, so I can, I can use this in my favor. So the inequality over time accumulates and gets larger. And that you can show with this. And then that's why, for instance, we uh, in that paper, what we test is different kinds of interventions. And the best intervention is if allies from the majority object to other majority members. And that's the only way that the dynamics can kind of uh, bring the, the the sort of the gap down as opposed to just drive it bigger. So huh. it's very interesting. It's like a very kind of a, uh, it's, it's like an equilibrium that one can imagine. So. One idea was that at some point, if we can measure everything about institutions, it would be possible to simulate and figure out what, what, what interventions might work.
But anyway, that's like a multi-agent simulation. Uh, I can talk to you forever. So I'm going to move to John before we, and then there are some uh, questions. I'm going to TLDR what you said. I really appreciate it. So I think that the, my favorite part was that your um, objective functions would be evolvability and robustness of computation. And I feel like that works both at the cellular level and at the very macro level. So thanks for that. John, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I mean, I get to hang, I've been hanging out with Jessica for ages. So, you know, you should have more access to Jessica. And, you know, I hope that at the very least, this is an opportunity, this will spur you both to talk more because uh, I can see there's just, you haven't even tip of the iceberg for Ida, I think, here. Um, uh, you know, I, you, you know, Jessica, you know, the thing is, and I think this was just your conversation with Ida is proof of this in a way that you're, what you're dealing with is so rich and it covers so many questions of that, you know, everyone from economists to ecologists to biologists, everyone cares about, right? These levels and everything you talk about, um, that everyone's going to want to see how you can come up with general, general formalizable ways for example, when can you, as you say, screen off and when can you not? You know, wouldn't it be amazing if one could actually bring some formality to that question? Um, you know, I struggle a little bit because there are so many terms that seem to be interrelated and, you know, whether it's coarse graining, emergence, hierarchy, level, uh, collective intelligence, you know, these terms are distinct, but they nevertheless borrow from each other. It's difficult to always know which one is superordinate, which one's subordinate. I mean, it, it, I find myself getting just personally a bit vertiginous sometimes with respect, but they all seem to be in this ballpark, right? Um, and I always find it interesting that even though you're interested in collective intelligence, these talks nearly always, and you were true to form, statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. It always comes up, that, that example. And I always wonder whether that example is actually beginning to reveal itself as a special case that is not that helpful, you know, because it, it seems to be the one that always comes up, statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, right? Um, and I can see the attraction because you started with it and then you pit at the very end of your talk on the paradox, which I was about to point out, and then you mention it yourself, which is paradoxically, in order to be able to say that something can screen itself off macroscopically, you're going to have to do a derivation as rigorous as the relationship between statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. In other words, I'm only going to be allowed to make the macro screen off argument if I can actually do, and you said in your talk, you're going to actually have to prove that you can derive the macroscopic from the microscopic. In other words, how are we ever going to get off the ground if you're not allowed to screen off macroscopically empirically based on efficacy, based on the fact that you can? And you're saying not allowed to talk about high screening off macroscopically until you've done a derivation as rigorous as the relationship between statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. It's it, it, which is what you said at the end, basically. Let me restate with your that. conditions, right? So yes and no. So um, yes, in this sense. So first of all, I, I think I went to great pains to point out that. Um, and you know, I do this more explicitly in other talks, but it's certainly implicit during my talk that this, the statistical mechanics approach has to change for biology because of the information processing. And so David and I, like 10 years or 15 years ago now, wrote this grant that was rejected at NSF in the you know, Physics of Living Systems with Brian Daniels, our, our postdoc at the time, on a, um, strategic statistical mechanics, right? And so we think there needs to be uh, you know, a, a new approach that takes, you know, that sort of hybridizes theoretical computer science and information theory, system mechanics, taking seriously inference, you know, in, in neuroscience and so forth, to do that right. So it's not going to be a repeat of what happened in physics. But I do, as I said in the beginning of the talk, think that that, that, that discussion is, you know, is useful and illustrates one that the models existed, the same kinds of models in some ways existed there as, as they exist um, now in, in biology. Um, and, and two, you know, I, I did, I do believe that, you know, it is, we have to be worried about bias and observer bias, right? We need to show that our variables are fundamental and derivable, but because, you know, in screened off systems and because of the information processing component, that's tricky, right? 
so you have to, you know, you have to have one of the reasons it's tricky is that you need, and I think in screened off systems, a longer time scale to do that, but, but maybe, um, you know, uh, that, you know, that raises the problems about like what data should you include and, and how are those data collected? There's all, the probability distribution of things is changing. So you have to, it's, it's definitely tricky, but I think you do have to do that. Now, what you were sort of criticizing most. Why, but why do you have to? Because you don't know then if but your why? variables, because you want to make sure two reasons. You want to make sure that your your variables are real, John. So they have to come from somewhere. We have to be well, empirically. If they work, if they, if, if, but if they what empirically mean, work. Let me finish, let me finish. So we want to be materialist, right? So the yeah. variables have to be derivable from the micro. It doesn't mean, but as I said, you know, over and over, um, if in the system where it's mostly screened off, then you know, all the explanation, the prediction largely is at the macro scale, but they come from somewhere. You can't ignore that. And the second reason is because, and now again. There's variation across biological systems in, in the extent to which information processing is really important. I think it's pretty important in a lot of systems, but I can see there's variation. In those systems where there's a lot of information processing, there's a lot of subjectivity. And you can, if you can maybe, you know, you can argue with me whether that's the case. I'm going to make that statement. I believe that to be true. And I think when that's the case, you have to, you're doubly required to make sure that the variables you've got are correct. Because I, I most of my work is on how um, you know components of biological systems construct their macroscopic worlds, right? It's it's the idea that these macroscopic worlds are constructed; they're co being computed by the system, and they bear some reflection or relationship to what's out there in the environment, the exogenous environment. But it, they could actually be quite um, quite uh, maladapted to that to some extent, and it's going to take a long time before the sort of evolutionary dynamic catches up to reveal that 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 um, misfit. So let right. me give a concrete example, Jessica, to you, to so if I'm understanding you cl cl correctly, just so I understand what you're saying. So let me let's go from particles that lead to the gas laws, the ideal gas laws, and you know, and and I'm going to go because Ida was asking about single cells. Okay, and we've had people on about single cells, and I, Ida was asking about objective functions. So let's try and combine those two, right? So in other words, we have a um, a single celled organism with a flagellum. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's a cost function, which, you know, the, the cell wants to go down the gradient towards the part of the Petri dish with the most sugar, okay? And it's got a velocity and a direction, and we can begin to say that the velocity and the direction of this single-celled organism is explainable by its flagellum, which is spinning behind it. And so I explain at a coarse grained level that the direction and the speed of this single celled organism is due to the flagellum. Now, it's absolutely true that, that you're gonna have to go into the cell if you wanna talk about ATP and mitochondria and how it's doing it and actin and tubulin and all that, but I don't need to do that. I don't have to go inside the cell to feel comfortable that the flagellum is causal for the movement of the cell. So in other words, you're making it sound like I'm not allowed to have a macroscopic coarse grained explanation for the movement of this cell via the spinning of its flagellum until I've proven definitively how it got molecularly constructed, how the energy is being made by oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria and aren't add on ad infinitum, right? I should be allowed just to talk about the flagellum right now so what am i missing here okay so um bad example not really but sort of let me so let me explain so um the first of all the onus isn't on the individual researchers the community so you know if you're you know you're studying like how a cell swims or something it's the community's onus to show that the flagellum is a real structure and not something that you know is a result of a voter bias. That's why it's a kind of bad example because it is a real structure. Um, but we, there, the individuality. Yeah, but how, but we don't. But I'm just asking. It's a real structure, but you, but you're if, unless I understand your final deep slide, it's it's a real structure that can be determined without knowing how it's constructed out of its intracellular components. Right? There's another way to get to the reality of it as a structure that doesn't require doing statistical mechanics on the flagellum, which it seems to me you're saying is the only way to feel convinced that it's a real structure. I, I think that you do have to show that the variable is derived from the microscopic and 
And, but I, but I think there are ways that you can get at that or feel comfortable, as you say, that you've got a, a genuine unit or structure that are maybe more statistical. Um, and, you know, our individuality work addresses this question too. So the motivation of that work was to get away from, we have, you know, in the, in the evolutionary biology community, they were making these assumptions about what an individual is based on proxies, like having a cell membrane or a cell wall. And, and everyone, you know, in making compelling arguments, that's what counts as an individual to have these kinds of things. That's what tells us what an individual is. And, and we sort of wanted to start from a first principles approach, which is a bit like the statistical mechanics argument uh, um, and not exclude a priori things that don't have, you know, these proxies. And so we ended up with a formalism for, um, for uh, individuality that defines it in terms of temporal uncertainty reduction, right? So the system, if it can predict itself in the future, that counts as an individual. And that allows all sorts of uh, entities to potentially be included in the individuality framework that were excluded using the proxies. And a lot of those people arguing for the proxies are making the same kind of argument you're making about the flagellum. They feel like they know what it is, right? But they're, they have a proxy definition, not a first principles definition. So that's why it's important. Now, I take your point, like, you know, we take shortcuts in science and we have to make them. And so the flagellum is an example where I... I feel like reasonably comfortable that you know you've got something real there and so and it is screened off but the James O'Dwyer study does cast some doubt on that so interspecies competition largely thought that cellular metabolism um, wasn't affecting um, uh, you know interspecies competition and, and they and he, with his postdoc they showed that in fact if you course screen the metabolism properly you can explain counterintuitive things at the macro scale so that's why I made this point that um, in the last part in that last slide that I think it was my second criterion that you need to, you can show that, um, you know, you need to ask whether a variable is screened off in two ways. And that was one, uh, the second one was this O'Dwyer one, which is that if you develop a good core screen description, does that improve your macro scale prediction? Right? So it might be, and I don't know in the case of a flagellum, it might be that if we had interrogated the system a bit more, you know, and, and look at the, um, the, the micro that's helping to generate that flagellum, we might understand something about some stochasticity, for example, and it's, you know, and it's pattern. And that could help us explain weirdness in, in the swimming behavior. I don't know. I'm making this right, up. But just to that point. Yeah. But just, but just to that point, that's a very deep point. We've had this on the show before, right? There is no doubt that there may be borrowings from the microscopic level, which will add terms to the macroscopic description. But in the end, you're still left with a macroscopic one right so in other words you've just added to it right so in other words you know and you know this final example and then we'll switch to questions is you know if you one of the things we see on the neurology wards a lot right is you'll have a healthy cognitively intact older person and then they'll get a uti and they'll get a fever right and the fever a temperature that's why i'm using that example because we're staying within temperature and volume that change in temperature will suddenly make them delirious they'll become cognitively very confused Okay. Now, what does it mean to say that a bacterium with a flagellum caused a UTI, that caused a fever, that led to delirium? Does that really mean that temperature and a bacterium, even though they can disrupt the system at the macroscopic coarse-grained level of psychology and cognition, is really doing the kind of explanatory work that you're talking about. We know that you can perturb systems with something simple like temperature. But I'm just trying to ask whether that example is really going to add to the coarse-grained macroscopic description of cognition before the fever hit, you know, hit, which will require a more microscopic explanation as to why this person is delirious. But outside the breaking disruptive scenario, it would be odd to say that that's the level of microscopic explanation you need for cognition. And it, yeah. it just, I, mean, I just don't seem to see. I can't say for sure. And that that's the whole point of my talk is that we, we need to, um, you know, we need to one recognize that there's variation across the systems on which we work and the extent to which the macro scale is screened off. And that's that failure to recognize that and quantify it, you know, is, is causing a lot of confusion because there are some people who are arguing, we only need to, you know, work at the macro scale to do the prediction explanation there. And other people are saying, no, we need the micro. And it's probably because some of us are working on systems where the micro isn't screened off. 
and others are working on systems where it is. And so we have these, again, these sort of biases that come from our study systems. So there's that issue. And then there's this, then there's, you know, then there's a, a I'm suggesting rigorous ways to start getting at this, make it a question instead of like arguing about whether we should or shouldn't measure it, you know, come up with a formalism for quantifying when there's a channel switch from micro to macro to macro to macro, right? When the dominant causality is switching scales, right? That's what I, that's what I want to understand. And, and I want, uh, you know, a measure of collectivity, a measure of how screened off systems are that we can apply to a variety of systems to one, get a sense of that real variation. And two, so that we can do less work, you know, in your case, maybe in your case, not worry about those kind of small causes or faraway causes at the micro scale, because we've shown the systems mostly screened off and we can concentrate on macro problem on the macro issues. That's exactly the motivation. Right, I, I want a principled way of doing this. I'm, I'm trying to acknowledge the, the variation. I'm, I'm suggesting a direction forward. I'm saying that this is like super cool, you know, this set of questions. And it could help. It could be very helpful in clinical settings, possibly, because it it it, it would substantially reduce the space of, of of causes that we consider. So macro to macro, micro to macro, just so I understand your terminology. So in other words, if the person was in the hospital and somebody walked in and it was a long lost relative and they were suddenly really happy and you went, oh, why are they so happy? There you could make more of a macro to macro kind of story about why they were happy that the relative came in. Whereas if they have a fever due to a bacterium that makes them delirious, you're right. We're probably going to have to tell more of a micro to macro story, even though they're both cognitive phenomena. Delirium is a cognitive phenomena and happiness that a relative has walked in. And if I understand you, one is macro to macro oh, it's a long lost relative. And the other one is delirium because they got a UTI. Is that what you mean by in one case, it's a micro to macro and the other one's macro to macro? Yes, basically, although with the caveat that I've learned from doing the individuality work, not to assume I know when it's micro to mi macro and macro to macro. So there are going to be cases that kind of look clear like the ones you just gave, but I just want to be the you know tedious scientist about it and say, let's actually rigorously work that out. But yes, effectively. Okay, I'll stop there because I get to see you too much. Yeah, I'm just going to stop. That's all I was <laughs> going to do. Like, no, no, I wasn't going to tell you to stop. I was just going to say, like, in this domain of uh, macro, macro, I think that the examples that uh, Fodor was giving in the hierarchy of sciences actually are helpful. For instance, if you want to explain how money does something in society, uh, there is no micro macro that helps you really because it's a piece of paper and uh, the value comes from a sort of a central bank putting some value on this. So the whole, all of the things are macro. There's nothing in the property of the piece of paper or the plastic credit card or like, you know, a, a coin that's not gold or something that uh, can predict its value. If anything, apparently some of the coins are worth more than their monetary value now. So there's some discussion about like how to deal with that. So um, by studying the physical property of the matter with which money is made, you're not going to be able to infer anything about the, the causal laws at the economic level or the macro macro level. That being said, when you want to uh, produce a new one, uh, one particular one, so that's like the anomalous monism here again, which is like there is one to one mapping. However, the, there are some relationships that are macro macro and some that are micro macro but there is not a type type identity in the ones, meaning a type in the macro level is not entirely reducible to a type type relationship in the micro level. I think you introduced an interesting nuance there, which is the paper money, like an artifact in which we encode something. And that brings more complexity to this conversation in terms of like the actual value. You know, I would say that like price and markets very much is a collective competition problem. And yeah, it's very I much, agree. you know, there is micro information in, in in um, you know market dynamics that will is definitely influencing price. Mm -hmm. So I think your point is another very interesting point about about encoding things in physical goods and 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 those physical goods as sort of placeholders or storage devices that we could talk about in this framework. But I take your point that the sort of physical properties of money have no bearing on its value for, yeah. most, for the most part. Although um, you know, well, it's the same with respect to the my price point, like um, you know, blockchain and Bitcoin and so forth public lectures, public ledgers, you know, that's all, that's all evolving right now, culturally. Yeah. And, and that know, being I said, uh, it's true that it might be that accidentally at some point, like the one, like, I don't know, bar of gold is the measure of something. 
but even that is like societally decided that this is a valuable thing. It's not that it's physics property again. And so I think the reason I brought that's this example- That's not a micro to macro point. I don't really think that's a micro, it's a, it is, it's kind of a false micro to macro point because I've never making a, I've never been making a point about the sort of, um, you know, the physical, it's a new, Sorry, it's not a counterpoint to you. This was to, as an analogy to this discussion of micro macro about money and physics that Jerry Fodor had in his paper uh, many decades ago. And the idea there was to say that there are certain macro macro relationships that have happen at the economics level that no physicist using just the laws of physics can infer or even say anything about. So the whole point there is that there is different levels of explanation and some macro macro relationships only happen at one level and there is no correspondence to the physical properties at the lowest level. So it's a little different than, um, it's not just about the physical object uh, instantiating, it's about the science of physics, ways of knowing of physics and ways of knowing in economics. What I would say there is you have two different- And I would argue to Ida's point. Well, just to Ida's point, I mean, I think that where Ida and I have spoken about this in terms of functionalism, right, is, yes, I think the case of economics where money and, we you know, we've said about chess pieces, you know, knowing about the structure of chess pieces is irrelevant to the rules of chess, right? But you can take that argument to psychology, right? It may be that there are coarse-grained discussions about psychology. Instead of chess piece or coin, like Ida mentioned, you could say jealousy, right? Or you could say intelligence, Right? Maybe those can just be cordoned off in just the same way as money and chess pieces can. In other words, it just, it, it, it's just, it, it, you, you know, it, 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 there's this, in the end, it seems to me that despite you're talking about emergence and coarse graining and levels, there is a kind of secret reductionism hiding inside you in terms of what you think the ultimate goal should be, which is to try and have some non-biased component proof. So I think there's a little error in there, and that's that the chess piece and money example are not part of the same system as the value of money and um, whatever the chess example was. It's a separate system. So it's two in interacting micro macro systems. It's the chess piece, the sort of physical properties and microscopic dynamics that give rise you know, to the chess piece interacting with a human social system that then uses the chess piece as um, to encode something that has its own micro to macro relationship. So two separate micro macro systems inter interacting there. It's not that chess piece example, money example is not evidence that's of macro screening off. There is macro screening off, but that is not evidence of it. I, I, I would- yeah, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, it, you mean. yeah, yeah. And, and I would just say this again, this was an analogy for John as an example of something that's a macro macro thing, which is the, the laws that explain money, for instance which are not physics laws. That, that was just like a very simple analogy as opposed to like a main point here. Something that was asked in the chat was, uh, John Roski said, I'm a bit confused if these multi-level distinctions are true or useful. Uh, the sense I'm getting is that the distinctions might be true but aren't always useful. And Zena says, I vote useful, not useful rather than true, not true. So Jessica, what's your position on that? So I think you need a little bit more explanation. So what is the question again? It's, I get true and useful, but um, so what's true and useful? Or uh, you, or useful? They say uh, if the multi-level distinctions are true or useful. Perhaps that person can elaborate a little bit in the chat and then I can answer it. So I'm not sure what they I mean think by they're making a, I think they're making that, I, I think we're probably making that distinction that's always made and you were making it a little bit, um, Jessica, which is, is this an epistemological, um, crutch for us that we have you know different disciplines like Ida mentioned or we coarse grain are we doing this because it's epistemologically easier for us or is it ontologically the case in other words I think it's the epistemology ontology distinction right in other words and I think you got it a little bit when you said is this true from the inside versus for us from the outside I think I I'm just I want to get away from it being easy for us on the outside and get being much more. I want to get away from using it as a crutch to simplify how systems work, imposing it as scientists and get towards understanding how the system is doing it, whether it's wrong or right. Um, and sometimes I think they will converge like the way we would do it as scientists, maybe the way the system has discovered to do it too. 
but I think we have to start from the system's point of view. So it's not about, um, it's, it's not about finding a description that's useful for us as scientists. It's about finding the description that's useful for the system. So is a button in an elevator? So in other words, you know, it would be very strange if, you know, I wanted the elevator to go up and I have this really interesting compressed control mechanism, the button. And there's actually a book that came out a year or two ago on the history of button pushing and what it did to the sense of power, you know, and, you know, you could press a button and launch a nuclear weapon. So you were divorced from the actual mechanics and the truth of what that bomb did. So in a way, a button is a simplified control mechanism. It'd be very difficult if I had to pull the pulley on the elevator or find a way to lift the elevator up. It'd be a very inefficient compressed control mechanism. So a button is a ontological simplification for going up, right? And you don't have to worry about all the details of how the elevator goes up. So would, would that be an ontological compression, a button that gets the job done for you as an organism and you don't have to worry about the details? I, I got lost in that example, but I hope Jessica got it. Yeah, I think it's a good example. So that's like sort of what we're after in building. I didn't say this, I say maybe one line about this, but one of the reasons we want these micro macro maps for intervention, uh, information processing systems is because in the end, we want to be able to do some, want to understand how nature intervenes, so they can evolve, come back to our evolvability, evolvability points and how in certain cases we might intervene. And so um, I think the, the goal is in some sense, nature's trying to figure out um, how to build a kind of mesoscale, how to sort of concentrate causality, if you like, so that it can tune. Yes. Very hard to tune a distributed system. But if you have- So a this button is, is like concentrated causality. Concentrated causality. So one of the reasons why, you know, I always balk when I hear all this ideological about distributed, ideological stuff about how good distributed systems are, because just like centralized systems, there are robustness and evolvability costs and benefits. And uh, we, you know, we want to understand when does it pay? When does it, when does nature invest in a kind of centralized um, control mechanism with this kind of um, you know compressed causality, an elevator button, if you like, that that allows tuning? When can it do that? What are the conditions under which it can do can do that? And and you know when when is that a bad idea? I think nature does do that, but it, it might be a hard problem. So just to uh, go back to what the chat conversation was. Uh, so Zena at some point asked, uh, as an example, a map is a useful abstraction of the real world, but it, uh, but I don't think there is any sense you can say a map is true, to which I responded, a map can be accurate or wrong. And Zena says, uh, I think only accurate relative to some mental model you might have of the cartographer. Suppose I, scr I scribble something and say, this is a map of MIC. No. So I think that that's the distinction um, that he wants to make between true and useful. I still think there can be an accurate map of NYC for humans. So, uh, but um, yeah, what what is your? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I think um, so. We're we're very much interested in you know how the system is is doing this collective computation. You know how errors are influencing that. Um, you know to what extent those errors can be washed out collectively or actually. Um, you know, end up being manifest in the, the, the macroscopic um, stuff it produces. And then figuring out too, how much or under what conditions can the system refine its computation so that it gets closer. It's very useful to have a kind of bar against which to ask how well the system's doing, right? So a bar that comes from an understanding of what you could do if you had say perfect information and infinite computational capacity. So um, that comes back to the to the useful. So can it do good work with limited computational capacity? Can can it um, and and some errors? You know that that's useful. Can it do good work despite these errors? Um, and when and what is it going to take to get? Does it does it need to get to this sort of um, you know, to reach the to reach the bar that we might um, impose as scientists, right? And maybe you know it comes back to also the point that biological systems are out of equilibrium. So the environment is changing. And so reaching some sort of, you know, um, highfalutin bar is probably not a good idea. It's a kind of satisfying point. So just to cap, uh, just to recap. So you think that um, robustness and evolvability are among objectives that are at play at different scales in nature. And that means that uh, in order to tune, and the, the point is to tune things and tune things in the world to the properties of the world or something like that to, to bio, tune biological systems to properties of the world and collectives. Uh, 
And in order to tune, uh, to tune something, we need to concentrate causality and centralized systems are easier to tune. And uh, so you I think there's, we need to do more work on that question, but I, I think that's the kind of thinking, the right idea. Certainly up to the point of um, you know compressed causality, doing a kind of dimensionality reduction, nature doing a dimensionality reduction to get sort of this mesoscopic level intervention that you could make rather than having to go all the way down to the micro to, to, do, to be evolvable. I think that's probably quite useful, but you know, I mean, open questions, a lot of open questions hidden in there. Very interesting. So uh, thanks. That's a coherent kind of perspective and I really appreciate the scope of it. Sorry, Montreal, you had to wait for a bit. Please go ahead, ask your question. Not at all. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Awesome. So I, I said, I'm just gonna read the question. I thought the talk was great. It was very uh, inspiring, especially recently. I've been looking at more like uh, anthropological, social evolution and uh, cognitive evolution readings. And I think that your framework kind of touches on some of that stuff or at least i think it's relevant and so i was just wondering did could you just give your thoughts maybe on how this you can adopt this framework this micro macro 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 um course scaling to maybe this sort of um shelter building or adaptive management this sort of social scale evolution that occurred in a group you know among a system but i think there's there's probably the macro macro story that maybe there's some elements in the environment i need to avoid and that may be inspired shelter building. And, but I think there's probably a cognitive story as well. And, and for me, I just couldn't, like thinking about it, I couldn't, I, I don't know where to start. So I'm wondering, you know. I'm, mi I'm missing a word there. You're saying something goading? Oh, sorry. What's the word? I'm just not hearing part of oh, what you Oh, sorry. Said. Well, what did I say before and then it'll help? Something goading? What's I don't know, no. Um, so I'll just like repeat that. What I want to know is like, um, can you maybe just express your thoughts on on how your framework adopts to maybe adaptive management or shelter building, and um, yeah, and whether or not they that is it, would it just be sort of a macro macro environmental story, or can you give a cognitive explanation to how these social skills or social societies may be developed? Yeah, absolutely. So two things on that. So first of all, a long long time ago. Um, I have a background in anthropology, and a long, long time ago, I was very influenced by the structural anthropologists of the first half of the 20th century in thinking about um, the sort of idea that a lot of the macroscopic world is in biology is collectively computed, and therefore, you know, not necessarily reflecting, recovering ground truths in the environment, but but constructed and, you know, taking on an identity of its own has roots in the sort of structural anthropologists. Um, the second point is that you mentioned shelter building. That's the word I couldn't understand. Oh, and um, so the parallel literature to this or very closely related literature is called niche construction. And niche construction is the idea that organisms um, modify environmental variables, thereby changing the selection pressures that they and their offspring are subject to. And a big focus in the niche construction work originally was on the building of shelters like beaver dams, um, you know, in, the, in, the, in an animal case. And so um, this the our collective computation for us is so much of the niche construction work is not really mechanistic or doesn't think much about how there's a lot of learning emphasis in it but doesn't think about how um those environmental variables are computed or how the you know the dam the structure is, is built and how that influences the niche construction process the collective computation work i've been talking about is very much about that it's about the feed forward process it's about understanding the principles involved in the feed forward process to produce whether it's a, a social variable or in, involves, you know, use of material in the environment and, you know, to, to construct a shelter and the consequences, the feedback consequences that it has for the, the builders. So um, I would I would suggest that probably for you, the, the best thing to do is to take a look at that niche construction literature because I think it would directly touch on your interests if you haven't already. I, I no, suspect. No, I haven't. Yeah, yeah. Not you have yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, so like, um, look at the work of like uh, Kevin Leyland and the St. Andrews crew on niche construction. Awesome, so, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Uh, so there's another question here, which is by Simon Stanton. And I asked them if they want to join the screen, but they, they said, ask for me. So they say, if a coarse grain macro state is too coarse, that is, if we are losing some of the entropy that is necessary to the microstate, how can we round trip and validate the macro is an accurate model of the micro? Are we relying on the emergent properties somehow 
Yeah, so the way we think about this problem is in terms of the, you know, what the optimal or, or, or good separation of time scales is between the macro you're constructing and the micro. And if you can, and we and we have some evidence that systems from systems we worked on and some others, it's just, that this can be tuned. But um, but if it can't be tuned, it's gen generally a problem. So allowing them to be more coupled allows more options or more entropy. So you can you can you can potentially adjust that by um, controlling the time scale separation. And then the, the question is what systems actually have mechanisms in them to control the time scale separation. I mean, obviously it's gonna vary, but is it something that can be is it a parameter that can be tuned? That's how um that's sort of the way we think about that problem. But just as an aside, you know. I say too that uh, it's often useful to think about. People think about entropy as disorder. I prefer, and this come, builds on some work of uh, the physicist Sharon Glotzer, to think about entropy in, as uh, as options, and, and and so option optionality is good sometimes, right? And so that, uh, just to, to I think your point is very relevant, and that is recognizing that. So basically, I think the question is a little bit like, uh, how do we do coarse graining to to have just the exact right amount of entropy and not less, right? Is it meta learning, for instance? What would be the mechanism for that? Is it meta learning? Yeah, I think it is a sec. So I would I, my answer to that is the tuning mechanisms are often second order, and I think that would be analogous to meta learning, but that would need a more technical discussion. Yeah, yeah, computationally, yeah, it would require another one, but it seems it's interesting. It's um, so to recap and put it in in the larger framework that you are mentioning, um, the objective is robustness and evolvability, and where that coarse grain becomes useful towards these objectives, and I'm going to use the term useful for that, uh, uh, would uh, would emerge basically by optimizing for these two principles. So and, what you, we, yeah. and also the second order part is, is controlling the time scale separation, which would allow you to switch between a system that um, emphasizes robustness over one that favors evolvability. I see. So there are two objectives. This is evolvability huh. and robustness. And then there is an algorithmic principle. Uh, uh, at least there is there's and there's some algorithm, which I would love to know what is that basic algorithm that is trying to optimize those. But this algorithm has a time scale switching uh, control system at the least. So the minimum criteria, so the minimum ingredients, if we wanted to make this work, would be the minimum ingredients would be objective is robustness and uh, evolvability. That would be defined in some way, some behavioral metric or some behavioral measure that can be tested or leads to survival or not of these kind of agents. And then second, the agents have some controller for time scale separation of what representations they're using or what, what model of the world they're using. Well, I have to think about that, that final part, but I think that, the, yeah, they have a controller that um, pretend, and there may be other ways of doing this too, that allows them to tune the time scale separation. With more time scale separation, you're, you're reducing uncertainty about the future to, for over a longer period. And so you're more in the robustness regime. And, you know, as you reduce the time scale separation, um, you don't get as much uncertainty reduction. You're potentially more in the evolvability regime. That's the way I would think about it. Uh, Jessica, can you just define evolvability just so where everyone knows what you mean by evolvability? What what does that mean? It means it means the ability to um, you know when the environment changes to still for the system to still fit to the environment. So basically, it's a trade-off between sort of being robust and to environmental change versus also being able to sort of change yourself in if the environment does. And so it's a bit of a trade-off. Is that usually is the that robust the probability it? thing is presented as a trade-off? I think there's some special cases where it's not like neutral networks might allow you to do both with no trade-off, right? So a neutral network where there's no cost mm -hmm. to defining to um, moving over a set of, of adjacent strategies. And that allows you to. So I just, just. Uh, I see, I see. And is evolvability related a little bit to the evolution of complexity? In other words, this very interesting thing that Peter Sterling in his book and Simon Laughlin talk about, which is, you know, this strange thing that you go from being a prokaryote to a eukaryote to being a big organism. You keep compartmentalizing and specializing, compartmentalizing and specializing. Uh, 
So in, in the end, you're a single individual, as you said, with all this compartmentalization and specialization. You have livers and kidneys and lungs and skin and feet and arms. And is, is that somehow a, a, a version of collectivity to you that that the evolution of complexity and the increase in size of organisms is just turning up collectivity to 11? Is, 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 is that a, a, you know, to Ida's point, is, is it actually part of your objective function to increase your complexity through having an ever better collective? So a BMW is a lot more complex than a Model T Ford, for example. Right. So you could argue that a Model T Ford became more complex and turned into a BMW with far more parts and specializations. So does the BMW have increased collective index compared to the Model T Ford? Is, is, is that a way of thinking about it or is that orthogonal? No, I, there's, I think there's a lot of important issues hidden in this remark, John. And one of them is that um, as you, you know, have more modules in your system, you basically have a lot of screening off of subsystems from each other. And so you're, there's a kind of increase in complexity in terms of an expansion of the number of parts, maybe, you know, maybe probably their interactions, but where you're ensuring some robustness by modularizing, screening these little parts off from each other. So, I, and we explored, you know, the robustness complexity trade-off in a kind of technical paper with our collaborator, Arjuni Hot I, which I can put in the, um, I can put it, you know, I can list some relevant reading. I can, I can include that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the evolvability thing, it's, it's a, that's a big area and there's a lot of different angles to it. And um, an, another angle comes back to our decentralized, centralized um, discussion earlier. And, and, you know, what's more evolvable, you know, a distributed system or one where you have like compressed causality buttons? Well, it, it comes down to what, what's tunable. And so the compressed causality is like an easier target. Like if you have a, a button or a controller, it's an easier target for evolution, I think than a distributed system, but you might not have the second order mechanisms, they're hard to evolve that, that you need to tune it. And so that was a point I wanted to make too. And one of the problems with robustness um, is that generally you don't um, need a robustness mechanisms until the system is perturbed. So it means that there isn't continuous selection for robustness mechanisms. The, the, the selection sort of sets in when you get the perturbations and that makes it a hard evolutionary problem. And there are various solutions that nature's come up with to, to sort of solve this, like by distributing functionality over lots of genes and they're all contributing a little bit to the output, but that that, that brings you back to distributed. So it's, it's just, there's a, like a tangle of interesting things in here. I like that. And I really like the idea that um, the robustness and perturbation might be something that learning actually helps. So learning can do controlled perturbation in safe settings for an organism to develop particular robustness in the algorithms that otherwise it might have to wait for an emergency to even need uh, the occasion for that. So it's a little bit like, um, I don't know, like the, the martial arts of <laughs> uh, biological life would be uh, kind of uh, controlled and safe robustness, perturb uh, robustness testing perturbations. Yeah, so two points, one, um, one on that, and that is, uh, there's a concept in evolutionary biology, which is very interesting, called arena selection or selection or a selective arena uh, that was uh, that Steve Stearns came out with and David has worked, David Krakauer has worked on. It's very similar to your sort of martial arts learning and safe setting example. And the other is just to go back to some remarks John made and just to flag these terms, we don't have to discussion about them, but robustness evolvability thing is related to another set of terms you might encountered, have encountered a fair bit, which is the explore exploit distinction. All right, Simon, thank you for waiting. Please go ahead and ask your other question. Oh, yes, good morning, thank you. Um, see, I do think my first question was also maybe what John was asking to begin with, with his, his first question. Um, so I'll move on, and you've talked about that a lot, and then you, Jessica, addressed my first question before. So my second question, I'm wondering about Prigo Gaines. I'm sorry if that's the wrong pronunciation. Criticism of coarse graining, how you see that, if you're aware of it. And he does, he's quite critical of Goldman as well. And I've read what Goldman wrote, and I don't see that he's saying what 
Prigogin says, and I'm just wondering how to think about this and, and um, if you have any thoughts about where he's coming from, because Gilman says entropy can be regarded as a measure of ignorance. And Prigogin then asserts that this and other similar arguments imply it is our own ignorance, our coarse graining, that leads to the second law of thermodynamics, which he then says, paraphrase, is untenable. Um, but I'm tr struggling to see that's what Goldman is saying, and that he's framing it that way. And I'm just wondering if this is something that um, has been addressed or if you've got any thoughts on. Well, I'm not familiar with that particular criticism of the of the course screening work, but um, yeah. certainly this idea of, of um, observer bias is relevant. And I think the point I'm making is a kind of twist on that, which is that we, we have to think about so how will, you know, our understanding of, there's coarse graining methods in physics and how will our understanding of coarse graining in biology, does it require a different set of methods or a different understanding of what coarse graining is and to sort of, and I don't know the answer to that yet, um, to, to, to broaden the discussion a little bit, one could say that coarse graining is a big focus of cognitive neuroscience actually in, in all the updating literature. Um, and, and there I think not all of the methods that we use to update could technically be considered core, core screening. It could be that there are other, this might be related to the criticism of Murray. I, I'm not sure since I, I don't know it, um, but yeah, yeah. it could be that there are other forms of compression and abstraction that don't um, fall squarely in the space of core screening that we're using to come up with our regularity estimates, right? I think that's reasonable that there are. And the question for me is what happens to, um, so one of the reasons I like core screening is because it does have behind it this incredibly deep and rigorous thing in physics relating to renormalization group theory. And I don't know how to harness that yet, but I Sorry, feel, got, um, I don't know how to theory? harness that. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, which theory in physics did you refer to? Renormalization. Renormalization group theory, yep, yep. And I don't know how to harness yeah, that yeah. yet, but I like the fact that there's this depth to it. And the question I sort of, and this is extremely preliminary that I've been kind of tossing around, um, you know, in conversations with my, once with my physics postdoc a, a couple of weeks ago and, and, you know, in these talks is what happens to, so you can think about renormalization group theory and coarse screening in physics as, and this is how Murray put it, as um, the, the way that you connect the very small to the very large. Right, that's what it does, and that's what's that's what's so you know powerful about it. And I love the way putting it that way. And there's a really nice article at Quanta magazine on renormalization group theory that that is extremely accessible. That like lays out the little the history of of how it developed and that point that I just made. So I suggest taking a look at that. But one of the things I want to know understand is, let's say that we're using other forms of abstraction and, and compression that aren't coarse grain. Does this does, does this how does this does this still tap into the, the idea that the, how the very small connects to the very large, or is that connection, that sort of more formal connection, broken? And I have posed this a couple of times, and I'm sure it's not yet well posed, and that's why the confusion, generous confusion in, in, in my sort of physics colleagues, uh, that they do seem to think it's interesting one. So I don't know, I think that relates to your question. And um, if someone here has ideas about it, I'd, lo I'd love to hear it. But to, to just to state it again, the idea is that Core screening and renormalization group theory in, in physics gives a, you know, a way to think about how the very small connects to the very large. And now here, we're, you know, I've been arguing for this core screening perspective, but it's possible and very likely that we're using other forms of abstraction that are not core screening as well. And, and I'm saying that those, the way we do this estimate, you know, these abstraction, this regularity estimation is how we go from micro to macro. It's going to inform our map. But is the deep sort of principle behind that broken if we're not using core screening? I don't know. Mm. Well, it's um, not necessarily broken if it's another way to get at the same end point, is it? Well, but I don't know if you can go, if you can make sort of rigorous statements about going from the very small to the very large, if you're introducing, for example, um, you know, things that aren't in the micro, course graining is supposedly yep. not doing that, right? Or if your compression, mm. or if you don't lose degrees of freedom. I, I'm not, mm. you know, Right, and you don't always. Not all compression is lossy, so I don't know if these things matter yet. But they're sort of like um, they're in my mind as as things that need a lot of discussion. And uh, I don't know. I, th I think they're very interesting. But okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I wanted to thank ask. You
Yeah, thank you. Uh, in relation to that, so let's say that we wanted to imagine um, a learning theory for coarse graining and in how the brain might organize perception or representation or memories of the world, right? Let's think about a centralized, it's already a centralized, uh, you know, uh, biological agent with a centralized control system. And now we wanna figure out what is the learning theory out of which, or very simple principles of learning or very simple objectives of interaction with the world. Out of these learning principles, we could um, either infer or out of them would emerge coarse graining. And this we know it exists. So some of my work is on multi-scale representations in different parts of the brain and how they correspond to our models of the world, uh, predictive as well as uh, memory. And so um, it would be very interesting to hear your thoughts, speculative, obviously I know that that's not maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe you actually have done work on this which is a kind of a coarse graining, but uh, from a perspective of representation learning or just learning, like how would an organism, a simple organism would evolve coarse graining? And we, at which point in evolution do you think we can say that organisms uh, display coarse graining? I feel like if from the single cells, we can see that. Um, but uh, I wonder how this would uh, change the coarse graining when you have multi-cell organisms as, as, and as you have central control and as you get more complexity in an organism. Yeah, so, hmm. Um, well, I mean, coarse graining, the first thing I think to note is that there, there, there's a variety of complexity of computations that can you can do Coarse screening can vary tremendously in the in, in its complexity, right? So you can do a very simple average up to you know a quite elaborate algorithms for a search in you know website search or whatever that involve many many mathematical steps, and th these can all be kinds of coarse screenings. Um, so the first that's the first point that there's tremendous variation in the complexity of the computation depending on the type of coarse screening you're doing, and, ha and consequently there's no reason to expect that you don't see coarse screening across a wide array of organisms from very simple to ones we canonically think of as more complex. Um, now, um, I think sort of hidden in your question is in terms of how organisms do it. Like one of the things we, we tried to work on some time ago and, and didn't do well at all, and it's because it's, you know, super hard problem, and I don't think really anyone can do it well yet, is, is actually ask about how, so we looked at a variety of algorithms for integrating opinions about, um, uh, to, for calculating consensus on networks or circuits about how uh, how much agreement there was among nodes about the capacity of another node to do something. And so we had a variety of algorithms for doing this, and we tried to say something about their complexity as a way of saying um, something about how, how likely the system was to be using one or the other. And it just turns out that the, the mathematical steps, there's so many different ways to represent the algorithms mathematically that it is impossible to say anything about their complexity. Um, now, we didn't we didn't push on that very hard and people who work on you know algorithm complexity think about these things to a much greater extent than we did but I, it's a, it's a challenging problem and one that i think was going to require some thought before you could maybe answer the learning question so you could sort of i think you could you could ask like how is the organism updating and and you might be able to like um say something fair you know reasonably somewhat crude about um how that you know what that updating involves but then they're probably going to be sorry updating what updating their updating their genome or updating their internal representations or updating their internal representations i see so we're not talking about um so in the case of single cell they do the, we, it's hard to argue for internal representation I guess it would be the signals that they are processing from the world or something like that, for instance, which is the gradient of food for sugar that they would go randomly, but if they send their sensor senses some gradient of sugar just moves in that direction. So yeah. that's the simplest. And how, and, and, you know, I think we know a little bit about how cells, you know, update based on gradients. Um, and I believe Sam Gershman just wrote a paper on learning in single in cells. In single cells, exactly. I haven't read it yet. Ugh. Um, anyway. <laughs> um, um, 
Yeah. Um. Did uh, actually, I had a did John Roski and Zeno were having all sorts of arguments in the chat. Do you think I you asked want to try Zeno if he wants to join? Uh, I asked. This, I asked, and it seems like so. If if they want, can you say in the chat? Okay, they're a little behind. John, do you want to ask it in the chat? Because temporarily, we're not synchronized with them. Um, they won't hear what you're saying until like quite a few minutes later, and then the answer. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's very interesting. Um, so going back to learning theory. Uh, question. Right. There is another question, um, uh, but just to finish what I'm saying. Um, I'm trying to to kind of like um, re re reframe sort of your very coherent perspective uh, from a learning perspective and see how would, what would be our principles for an organism to start learning or, or figure out that it needs to learn a different kind of uh, uh, course graining. Mm -hmm. um, or when does course graining appear in the learning principles of an organism? Uh, how or how does it emerge in the learning principles of an organism? And the reason for that is obviously I'd like my agents to develop that on their own instead of me telling them how course to represent the world or such. Um, oh, so 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 that so there's a lot in there I think. And if you're asking a question like I think uh, an interesting question is over. So if you're taking an average and the environment is also changing on some time scale. Mm -hmm. And you need to take your average and and update it. You know, it's it's gonna your average is gonna be a placeholder for some period of time, and and then it's no longer gonna be a good representation of the microscale or the environment, right? So um, that comes back to this question of of um, how you detect that the environment is changing, and whether your updating is continuous or 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 you have um, like a you know, a command or something that says, once you detect environment is changing, then you then you then you compute your course screening again. So there, are like, there's lots of potential variations here. There's one that you're sort of like continuously taking measurements, and your your course screening is changing slowly with those measurements. And another is that you have it as a placeholder for some period of time, and then you measure again when you detect the environment has changed, or maybe just for robustness purposes, and you drop your first estimate, and replace it with your second. That's interesting. More like a Right? That's so, more similar to the memory, um, the way that like memory representations would work. It's that you would only change when things in the world would change. Um, as in, you, you would receive a prediction error. You see a prediction error, then you might start to recompute. So the prediction error idea, you know, it's very similar to our mutual information yeah. idea, right? It's basically about minimizing uncertainty. But the, the the question is when you do it, right? Are you doing it continuously, or are you having do you have some kind of like meta? Um, operation where you're also assessing whether the environment is changing, so you need another computation to do that. And when you get, uh, when you, you know, when you when you get a signal that indicates the environment is changing, then you recourse grain. Hi, Zena. Uh, so Zena was the uh, person that was discussing in the chat that I was reading. So now he can maybe uh, add his. Yeah. So I did have one comment actually on on your question, Ida. Um, I think one answer might be uh, an agent having kind of constraints on its computational capacity. So like when I think about coarse graining or abstraction, I think of them as synonym, synony synonymous, but maybe you think differently. Um, I think we often do that to be able to reason more efficiently about the world. So. You know, I want to make some plan to go from, you know, here to the shop, right? I don't have to reason about all of the low level steps to get there. I can reason at this higher level. Um, and that is useful because I'm a bounded agent. I don't have infinite resources. So maybe, maybe um, just the fact that there are computational constraints could lead to this kind of coarse grain in emerging. Um, another point, actually, I've got a project ongoing um, where we're trying to explicitly put in this notion of causal abstraction into the learning process. So if you imagine like a an RL style agent, um, in addition to its kind of um, 
you know, objective, we have this additional uh, term which encourages it to learn abstractions of the world. Um, and so that's a little bit different to your perspective. It's not so much it's emerging, but kind of like pushing it in there because we think it will be useful. Um, that's super helpful. And I just want to highlight a, um, a very wonderful moment because like I'm in the kind of more RL and neural networks as in like, you know, a, a little bit on that side. Uh, you and I are in the probabilistic uh, tradition and like the bounded rationality ideas and the way that that's uh, done. I have like one paper in that direction that I combine RL and probabilistic for finding out the rational use a combination of episodic and working memory, but that's not my main expertise. And then Jessica, you work uh, with the dynamical systems and physics perspective um, more uh, than I guess these other uh, approaches in cognitive science. So I think it's a wonderful uh, way that I'm surprised that we it's it's easy to understand each other and I'm surprised a little bit in a positive so it's a positive prediction error for me. <laughs> Seems like mutual information is high, but uh, what I was thinking is um, uh, that's a good way to put it. The bounded rationality idea. So you're saying so coarse graining might emerge, or maybe maybe if I translate it, what you're saying into this idea of why would an algorithm develop. Uh, coarse graining. Why would a learning engine that's evolving develop it or evolve it? Would be because there are computational constraints. For instance, uh, if you have a lot of cells, it goes a lot of control into. Oh, hello. <laughs> we. <Really>? Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, what's the name of the cat, by the way? The Aleph. Oh wow! First you like Borges? The Aleph Borges in the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so I wonder whether this would translate a little bit to that, that would say, hey, um, the organism has a lot to handle in the control system, so it wants to re uh, increase computational constraints to do as much with as minimum amount as possible. So it's a little bit like a parsimony idea, yeah? Except, so some caveats. So one thing, the first thing is a technical definition of course screening, so is one form of abstraction, but because it has these, it has these two criteria, one of them is lossy, and two, that it um, that it doesn't introduce anything new to the system. So that that's not true of all forms of abstraction and compression. Um, and but I this idea that like we like you know I like I thought along similar lines this idea that the compression could be a kind of um, you know efficient way to represent the world. But some caveats to that are like in one of the systems where I've thought about this in these primate systems where they make these um, the monkeys make these um, subordination signals. And the subordinate they use the subordination signals to indicate agreement to yield in the relationship. It's a relationship state they're signaling, not just willingness to yield in the present context. And I could, it's very interesting how they do that. I could explain that. But um, with respect to the present conversation, the way we think about it is the monkeys have a series of fights with each other. When one learns, and it doesn't always happen because the asymmetry between them is not always big enough, but when one learns the asymmetry is large and the other is likely to win, it, um, it registers that, and over the time series of fights, or over the history of fights, it computes the sort of average um, asymmetry. And if the asymmetry is big, then it gives a subordination signal. And, and then the fighting dynamics change. They actually fight much less. They still fight, so they can keep the information flowing about who's, you know, their fighting skills. But they fight much less and allows them to interact with each other peacefully much more. But the, the signal is, we think, a kind of placeholder. It's a coarse-grained representation of their perception of the state of the relationship. And the argument that we make around these signals is that they, they drop the fight history. They no longer have to remember the whole fight history, which we assume is computationally intensive to do. And they can just re remember the placeholder variable instead. But it's it, when you think start thinking about that a little bit more deeply, it's not that simple because they need some way to store, you know, and have a, they need a special signal they have had to evolve as this kind of placeholder. So there are all these things that have had to happen to make it possible for them to use that course screening in a meaningful way. And um, so the efficiency argument, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong because I still believe it, but it starts to break down a little bit when you consider these other factors that have to come into play in order to, to make that, um, to make that course screening, that, 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 that coordination signal work in this way as a stand-in for the history. And, it, and then you have to think too about like the neural complexity that's required to do that. So it comes back to a point I made a long time ago about these systems Actually, you know, we're often thinking about these certain variables or parts of the subsystem in isolation, and we really have to take into account. We have to have a, you know, uh, especially as we go up levels, you know, uh, there, there's a, there's a lot more objective functions.
and right so so uh, jessica uh, when you when you mentioned the definition of coarse graining um that coarse graining you know it's it's lossy it's abstract it's compressed but it's not adding anything new but, right but technically um, it's not but in nature it probably is and that's one of the things i want to understand so the technical definition of that's what I was about to ask you. I was just to, so so that's what I wanted to ask you is to the degree that it adds something new is 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 it because there's a version in nature that actually defies the technical definition? Well, it wouldn't. Or is it that once you've done once you've done that once you've done the compression the abstraction, there's new work that can be done that would not be able to be done if you'd not taken that step. In other words. Is that the way that? So you're getting doing things. course training is helpful because it's. Yeah. Yeah. Which ways do you mean so it? Yeah. I hit on both in my talk. So the the, the first point is that I'm interested in and in how you know components and larger systems are estimating regularities. I think one way that's happening is through course training. I like the course training um, tact because it connects back to deep ideas in physics that connect the very small to the very large, you know, in a rigorous way. Um, two. It, it could be that you know the target is coarse graining, but that because there's error and bias in the way organisms and components are doing computation, uh, and there's a lot to discuss in there. The it's not technically coarse graining because they're taking an average, but they're introducing things that since they have their own like theories of how the world works, they may be introducing things that aren't really there, spurious correlations and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, that make it mm -hmm. technically not mm -hmm. really coarse graining, even though they're still taking an average. And so one of the sort of um, one of the issues that to work out that's so interesting is how does sloppy coarse graining, you know, impact the robustness mm -hmm. of micro to macro maps, right? The ability to connect in a rigorous way, the very small to the very large or the very fast, to the very slow. Mm -hmm. right? So that's an interesting question. And the second mm -hmm. part of your question touches on you know, my macroscopic expansion point that I only in this particular salon got to make, usually spend more time on that, make um, briefly, which is we think what's going on is there's, all this complexity at the micro scale, we all sort of know it, but we haven't like adequately theorized about it yet. Consequently, nature's forced to do some compression, maybe in the form of coarse graining, generating um, an information bottleneck, whether it's right or wrong, an information bottleneck, a kind of effective theory for how the world works that allows when it's good, presumably, access to new behaviors and strategies that weren't access, that weren't um, accessible yeah. prior to mm -hmm. the coarse graining. And we have we have evidence mm -hmm, for that. Mm -hmm. Now I'll give you one example from our sort of monkey work, and that is the monkeys. They do this. They have these fights, you know, at the kind of pairwise level. They learn from their history of fights who's likely to win. They give a subordination signal. There's a circuit of these subordination signals encoded in the circuit. Is this macroscopic observable distribution of power? And um, and we study the algorithms for integrating the sort of opinions in the signaling circuit about who everyone thinks can win. And that gives us this interesting distribution of power when the distribution's heavy-tailed, which we see in some systems meaning that there are some individuals who are perceived to be disproportionately powerful. In those systems, we think um, new forms of conflict management are accessible that were not accessible under other distributions or when there's no um, emergent distribution of power. And in particular, we find evidence for this special third party policing where these very powerful individuals use almost no aggression to break up fights. And in breaking up the fights, they allow, um, and we studied this through perturbation, they allow the system, they allow the components in the system to have much richer social networks much richer local social niches. So lots of things are happening here. They get this heavy tail distribution power. It facilitates um, export, you know, use of a conflict management strategy that's intrinsically costly, but where the cost is completely changed for the ones in the tail of the distribution to nothing. It costs nothing for them to do this behavior. The policing behavior fundamentally changes the social dynamics, allowing for a much more um, sort of a cohesive, cooperative social system. And then under other distributions of power. So is that, so it, so just so that's an amazing example. So when does the word coarse graining get you? So the coarse graining was what led to this new dynamic, which then led to this sort of emergent, you know, heavy tail with yeah. some super police yeah, well, and then fed back. When does the coarse graining get, when do you stop using the word coarse graining and use scales. the word emergent? Or is it coarse graining? So it comes back to Ida's point. You know, when, I when I finished my talk, I was saying that this collective computation idea applies across scales. So the coarse screening comes in when the monkeys are, um, you know, 
uh, averaging over their or doing some computation over their fight history to decide whether they should give the subordination signal. The subordination signal is a we believe is a coarse grained representation of the fight dynamics. The circuit of subordination signals, the algorithm that sort of um, that um, integrates or aggregates the opinions that measured through the use of the signal and gives the distribution of power mm. as output. That's the computation um, is as a coarse graining. So there's you know at least two scales of coarse graining. There's this sort of coarse graining to get the fight rate. Uh -huh. There's That's another awesome. coarse grain at the circuit level to get the distribution of power. Uh huh. Very interesting. I'm just going to leave a paper yeah. in the chat um, where they show that shared neural code. There's a shared neural coding for social hierarchy and reward value in primate amygdala. And then they basically looked at uh, social hierarchy. <coughs> and so it seems like what you're saying is there are certain things that one perceives there is a memory. So if I wanted to translate what you're saying into a hypothesis about what's happening in the brains of these monkeys. Um, one thing is the normative stuff you said, which can be kind of like discussed in different ways. Um, for instance, uh, it, it can also be th thought of in terms of how power structures change. So if there is another group that starts to gain power in other ways or constantly resist the power and create a different kind of uh, way of policing the more powerful ones who are policing the first group, like there's all, all these dynamics that can emerge. So it's interesting that you were mentioning that as a way of um, larger groups of people having lower cost com conflict resolution. But it's interesting to also see it as the cost that it will have for uh, the populations that are now uh, by default in the kind of like the police uh, in the in, in that. So let's say the child uh, of a monkey that lost the fight uh, a lot, like what social status that one was. So there's like some consequences of that. But this one, uh, the newspapers are basically uh, looking at uh, rhesus macaque colony and how the uh, amygdala might represent the social hierarchies of that macaque colony as the aggregate response of what you were saying before. And this is the region of the brain that some people uh, uh, like to discuss it in terms of processing certain affects, especially fear and things like that. So if you lose this, you also lose fear. And uh, But it's not the only thing it does. There's a lot of value-based work that it does. So if I wanted to translate what you're saying is that there would be some kind of memory replay maybe, or some kind of, uh, so there's different ways, right? It could be that the monkey's constantly keeping it running average. So it's like a kind of a tally of all the fights. Every monkey has a tally. Or it could be that when a fight is happening, the monkeys are replaying other memories of this monkeys having fought. And then they're like, oh, this guy last time I saw him also won, or this guy last time lost. So, so they're kind of updating, or there could be both happening at the same time to update it. But either way, it seems like there is um, what you're describing is that memory plus integration of that signal would translate into um, would translate into this coarse graining of social hierarchy, for instance. That would be like the coarse graining hypothesis for testing the cognitive operations in individual monkeys that leads to the social hierarchy being uh, sustained with this one signal instead of all the history all the time. Yeah, I mean, so rhesus monkeys are an interesting example because they um, probably for a combination of biological, neurobiological, and social reasons can't get this policing behavior, it seems. So one thing they don't do is, is that they don't really have the subordination signal, they just have submissive versions of it, yielding in present flight. And it, it, it seems to be a consequence of feedback. So there's like memory in the system and memory in individual heads that's operating here. Um, and uh, because they, it sort of they, they can never because they can never um, they haven't been able to divorce the signal from the ag aggressive context into a peaceful context because they don't have the oppor opportunity to interact in peaceful settings that often. So there's this kind of feedback that prevents them from ever sort of developing the use of the subordination signal, which is an important slow variable that that then prevents them from developing a heavy tail distribution of power. And so you, it, it looks to me like the rhesus monkey systems tend to be much more coupled than, say, a pigtail macaque system where you see this kind of thing happening that I just described. So it comes back to the time scale separation and, and all the feedbacks um, that, that, could, that that influences. The, the sort of um, potency of the feedbacks, are, they're more potent if there's more time scale separation. Then are you in England?
Is that right? Yes, I'm in England. So it's probably it's, it's like getting towards one in the morning. So do you have um do you have another question before you go into coma? Yeah. So well, yeah. Um. So in the example that you just gave with the with the macaques, was it? Um, like one thing that came to mind was maybe there are two different things, and I'm not sure sure if they're the same. So this is kind of my question. So if I'm aggregating things in the world, um, this is a kind of coarse grain in some sense, but it seems a little bit different to I've got a separate model, which is coarse grained, right? So in other words, um, it seems like if I'm ever going to make any kind of decision, there's going to be some kind of aggregation or some kind of decision or, you know, uh, compression, compression of information, because ultimately I have to make some decision. Um, but that seems different to saying I've got some model, which is at a coarser grained than the real world. And there is some separation and I can reason at this higher level. And so my question is, are, are these two things the same or are they different in your mind? Can I maybe translate that uh, if, if I understand it correctly? I want to make sure I understand it correctly. So one perspective, one hypothesis is that this kind of behavior that could be explained with a coarse grain theory happens at the moment of decision when they're integrating. And the other hypothesis says they're caching the, co the coarse grain representations and reasoning at that level, right? Those are the two hypotheses you're describing. Yeah, and the first one I think would always happen in any kind of decision making or any, actually any kind of even perception, right? Like the, the moment you start right. integration, processing right. information, you're gonna be yeah. doing some kind of aggregation. Um, Right, but so it comes back to how like lossy the abstraction is. I think that's also the point is that in the first case, it's not very lossy. And in the second case, it is more lossy. And maybe uh, an interesting question, you know, I think how lossy it, it can be is, is and still be still aid decision making is a consequence of um, how much the microscale is changing. So if the microscale is changing a lot, then you really don't want a very lossy core screen description. You know, if it's changing, if it's not just fluctuations, if it's fluctuations, if there's a lot of fluctuations, but they're not meaningful, yes. But if there's the environmental, if the probability distribution at the, at the micro scale is changing significantly at the, at the bottom, then you want one uh, to, for your course grain to be over sh the windows to be short, to be smaller. And two, um, you know, then I consequently, I guess, because of that, it will have, um, it will be less abstract. Maybe for any given window, it might be reasonably abstract, but overall, over time, it will be less abstract. So abstraction- I also think that Zen was talking about- Fitting argument. What? But it's also, I think Zen was distinguishing between, you know, perceptual course grading where, you know, you're a rhesus monkey or a baboon and, you know, there's a, a leopard coming towards you and you have to make some sort of decision about whether to run or stay put. And so you, you know, I don't know, you make some sort of diffusion to bound like decision about whether to run or not based on the speed and things like that versus, well, if it's a leopard, that's actually a baby leopard, I can make the inference that it's not going to be dangerous. So in other words, you have a model of leopards being dangerous or not dangerous. And so you have a, a coarse grain model, if it's half the size, it's a baby leopard and it's not going to eat me. So that's that sort of very simple model of whether you should be worried or not about this leopard. That's one form of inference versus just having to make some sort of integration over, is it coming towards me? Is it, far, is it fast? Is it far away? And that's a different kind of integration you're doing, right? And they're both coarse graining in a way, right? You, you know, you reduce the leopard to a mass that's moving at a certain speed. And in the other one, you have a coarse grain model of big or large, harmless or dangerous. They're both coarse graining, right? Even though one's a kind of inferential model of leopard danger and the other one is a variable about its behavior. But I guess my- right? And they're both, but, but I think what he's asking is they're both coarse graining, right? They're both a form of coarse graining, right? So I think th the way I would put this, I see two things in here. The way I would put this is in, in one case, um, you have uh, you're you're invoking your previous memory to a greater extent. They're the coarse graining that you have, that you've done in previous similar situations, presumably. And in the other case, you're not relying on that step. 
but I would challenge you and to ask like how you know if you're just doing the taking into account how fast the leopard's running and all that and not thinking about the baby leopard too how how you know which variables to focus on without having done some having some kind of model in mind from previous evolutionary learning time so can I maybe come back to Zena's thing with a brain example? Because it, it, if we go too many levels of uh, analogies, I will lose like the, uh, <laughs> the main one. Because with the brains, what I was thinking about is, so what we observe and our, our models suggest is that multi-scale representations simultaneously are cached in the brain, in just different parts of the brain. And depending on the decision, different networks would recruit different levels of uh, granularity of these representations. Some of them are scales of abstraction, some of them are temporal scales, some of them are spatial abstraction and like, you know, the mm -hmm. like. And different parts of the brain might be interested in different kinds of coarse graining, so to speak. Yeah. And so, um, I, I, so the, that idea that actually some things are cached would be the second, I think it would be the second kind that uh, Zena was talking about. Mm -hmm. The first kind would be a creature that let's say it doesn't have memory or it has only one scale of memory and everything else that's coarse grain or whatnot, it has to do on the fly. It has to use computation to at the moment have that information. For instance, it needs to integrate some information from memory to figure out if uh, somebody is dangerous or not. But every time it has to do it again, it has to do the computation again. In the other one, the different um, scales are cached somewhere like different kinds of memory or representation and whenever needed they will be recruited now one point would be an algorithm that chooses the right scale at the moment of decision but it's a little different from the other one that has only one scale of memory or no memory and has to integrate everything at the moment of decision so now, is that like corresponding that was exactly the kind of example yeah, I, I, I was trying to make that example, right? Speed, Sorry. integrating I, speed I, I on the fly, baby like I was saying. I didn't get the baby leopard versus, one. Versus, the versus, versus, having a, versus having a cached model of when are they dangerous or not. You've known that offline, right? Up, oh, they're not dangerous. You just do an inference on a cached notion that when they're small, they're not, diff, they're not dangerous. Versus when it's running towards you, as Ida says, you have to compute right now on what there it's doing, go. right? And, and that's the difference. Yeah. yeah. So in other words, but both of them are kind of coarse grained. You're computing on the speed versus a cash model of small is not dangerous in the past. I can just retrieve size as the relevant coarse graining. Yeah. So I think you're both kind of capturing what I meant. Maybe I'll add a little bit, not to, hopefully not to add more confusion to it. Um, uh, for me, maybe the main distinction is in, in one scenario, uh, a coarse graining is just a property of, of the world, or at least a property of your observations of the world. Uh, and in another case, uh, you've built a model of entities, which may or may not be properties of the world, right? And so, um, you know, like I can look around and say, how many objects are there in my, in this room? Maybe there's 10, that's the coarse graining of of, of this room in some sense, right? But it's not really a a, a model, right? Um, and it kind of is, because how you define objects and the boundary of objects with other things depends on your perceptual apparatus. And if, for instance, you're not seeing infrared things, you might miss some distinctions or whatnot. So it yeah, relies yeah. on your model of what counts as an object. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree, fair enough. Um, I guess maybe maybe my point then is that you're not, uh, or at least to a lesser degree, imposing some additional structure, which is not, uh, I would say, yeah, like, I mean, going to John's example, right? Like I could, I could build some model, which, which the, the, so the variables in that model are the abstractions. And in some cases that's a useful thing to do. In some cases it's like not necessary, right? Going to the examples that, that you, you mentioned. And so, you know, saying that out loud, it seems that maybe there's not like a hard boundary, but it seems yeah, that there, there are at so. least kind of a spectrum. Uh, I agree. So uh, I agree that there could be a spectrum. For instance, uh, larger things are more dangerous or faster things are more dangerous. That kind of a generalization seems like it's uh, it relies 
it, it might sound to you like it's uh, about the outside world only, but really it's like things that appear larger to me are more dangerous to me, right? Uh, or things that appear slower to me are less dangerous to me or things like that, right? So it, there is a to me thing. There is a perceiver, um, observer kind of uh, perspective. And uh, the I think the challenge is that because we are, uh, so that, that this becomes into the philosophy of science part of things, of course, which is uh, what would it mean for coarse graining of reality without perception? Is there such a thing? So I agree there could be a spectrum, but I don't think there is a completely independent of the model version of coarse graining that I can imagine. But I totally see what you're saying, because coarse graining of representations of spatial locations in the hippocampus is a very different level of models represented versus me saying, oh, big, fast things are dangerous, right? Right, right, exactly. But you know, this all comes back to Wheeler. I'm actually, look, it's getting to, it's getting. Um, look, I, I don't want to be, you know, just so you know, Jessica, you've been at this now. It's been two and a half hours. It's six forty. Um, it's your fault. <laughs> I, I actually do have to go. Um, uh, but obviously, um, I, I mean, I don't think we have any more questions that are new, as far as I can tell. Um, and Zena, you know, it's, you know, we're doing great, um, even though it's super late, but. Do you want to answer, Ida, do you want any more questions or things that came up before? I want to hear what Jessica, Jessica wanted to say before, uh, yeah, what Jessica wanted to say. I just wanted to, the, the, the tenor of the conversation has brought me back to Wheeler, who has started my talk with his point about observer participancy and perceptual you know, capabilities of our observers, which is a, made by a physicist and a physicist for physical systems. So... Do you mind adding a link no. to some of the papers, including the Wheeler paper that you mentioned? So it's it's the um, I'm trying to see which paper it is, but yeah, if you just drop it in the chat, so for people who either see it now or later, they can figure it out. Is there another way I can drop instead of doing that? Is there a way I can um, send it to me later? Yeah, exactly. Sure, I can well, share it. or on Twitter. You can also add it to the Twitter um, thread. Is it the uh, you know about Twitter? Jessica? <laughs> Not lately, I don't, but I used to know about it. I'm getting back to it. Okay, yeah, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll add some references, and I can't, it will be today or tomorrow, to the to the thread for the salon. Mm -hmm. For Thank those you. interested. Yeah, I think there is like a statement from Wheeler or somebody that is like, we used to think that like the, um, the universe is out there, and the, so the, he's opposing this idea that the universe is out there. Basically, that kind of a perspective. I re, I, I don't remember the quote, but I'm going to look for it. Um, right. Okay. So, John mentioned time. <laughs> Thank you so much for staying here so long. Um, and there was a question by Colin Hales. I want to make sure he doesn't think that he, we are ignoring it. It's just I don't understand the, the questions uh, yes, relevant yes. to this conversation. Uh, so if, uh, Colin, um, uh, I will send your question to uh, to Jessica uh, and separately because she can see it, or you can send it in the Twitter chat or something. Uh, thanks again. Uh, thank you, John. You've been frozen, by the way, most of the time. John, you're still frozen for us. Your video is always frozen for some reason. Um, and thank you, Jessica. And it's actually you. me just, it's just me pretending to be frozen. Oh, there you go. I'm actually just <laughs> pretending. <laughs> You're very good at it. All right. <laughs> Bye, <laughs> Jessica. Big hug, okay? Bye, That's Zeno. Bye, Ida. Thank, you. thank Bye. you, guys. Triple, you. triple favorite people. Bye. Aww. Bye. <laughs>